Okay. Have everyone? Okay. All right. Do I need to... The strong. The strong. Okay, which way which, which do you want? Yeah, what's yeah. finest? Yeah. The kids are selling that. No. no, you're talking about the uh, flow. I mean, it's hooked. I was never. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I am going to go ahead and call this meeting to order. Uh, so we start off our meetings with a moment of silence. So I'm going to ask you to join me uh, in standing up for a moment of silence before I do the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, next we will have roll call. Commissioner Allen. Sorry. Commissioner Allen. Commissioner Kelly. Here. Commissioner Jones. Here. Commissioner Lanier. Present. Commissioner O'Connor. Present. Commissioner Rapart. Here. Mayor Bliss. Here. And can I get a motion to excuse uh, Commissioner Allen, who is out of town? Support. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Thank you. All right, next that will take us to our first opportunity for public comment tonight. And as we get started on our agenda, for those of you who haven't joined us in the past, I'd like to just walk through our agenda uh, and tell you a few things in addition to some things we've added on tonight in anticipation for a full house. Uh, so if you have an agenda, um, you'll see it in front of you. At the very top, we have a number of uh, guidelines and rules for our public meeting. Uh, and so we ask that you honor those. One of them is not holding up signs so if you have a sign I'm going to ask you to put that down so our goal with public with uh, allowing for public comment is that we want to make sure that individuals who uh, feel differently about an issue if they have different opinions that they feel that this is a safe place to share those opinions so we want to make sure that we're really respectful of that so I'm going to ask you to take a look at those we're going to ask people not to clap even if you feel really strongly in support of what somebody is saying uh, we're going to ask you to hold on to that because we don't want to intimidate someone who may feel differently who wants to also speak okay so a couple things about our agenda we have multiple opportunities for public comment tonight uh, the very first one is public comment on something that we're actually voting on today uh, and so we have a number of items that we talked about this morning during one of our earlier meetings during the day our standing committee meetings is what we call them uh, and so we, those are on the agenda so our first opportunity for public comment is specifically about an agenda item that we're voting on and when you come up to, to speak we ask that you specifically say what agenda item that you want to speak to uh, we always ask people to come up to this space up here for public comment and we have um, implemented a, a new process just to make sure that we get people's names correct so when you come up to speak uh, regardless of what public hearing you're here to speak on um, we ask that you write down your name and the city that you live in just so that our clerk here can uh, make sure that it's accurate as it's put into public record uh, also tonight we have comment cards and I'll get to those in a moment uh, so the first opportunity for public comment is if you're here to speak on something on the agenda then we have scheduled public hearings and we have a number of those tonight so if you're here tonight to speak about the brownfield plan development on Bridge Street um, that's a scheduled public hearing I will open up that public hearing a little bit later on uh, and then we have the uh, public hearing on the housing initiatives and the zoning changes. Uh, we also have a 
uh, public hearing on alcohol for off-premises consumption, and then we have one for an MDNR grant that we're submitting. Uh, so we know that a lot of people are here to talk about the Housing Now proposals, and we also have comment cards for you. Uh, so if you want to grab one of these and write down some comments, we'll be picking up those at the end of today, at the end of tonight, and those will all be aggregated and shared with the full commission. So if you want to <coughs> leave something in writing, you are absolutely welcome to do that. Uh, and then at the very end of the meeting, we will have just open public comments. So if you're here to speak about something that's not on our agenda or something outside of the four scheduled public hearings, that opportunity for public comment is at the end of the meeting. Okay, uh, so hopefully that was really clear. We're really glad to have a full house tonight. These are critical issues uh, to all of us, and so your input is really important. So with that, I will open up the first opportunity. Did I miss anything? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, City Attorney. We also have overflow space. Uh, so up here in room 901, right over here, if you want a spot to sit until the public hearing that you're here to speak about is open, you're welcome to go into room 901. And then we also have room down on the sixth floor in room 601, and you're welcome to go down there too if you want a spot to sit. Uh, and then and the meeting is being and it's. Broadcast. It's, it's live broadcast, so you'll be able to watch it, uh, and then you'll be able to come back in here when you are ready to speak. Okay? Did I miss anything else? Okay. All right. That's good. That's good. All right. So let's get started tonight with our first opportunity for public comment. And again, this is uh, if you are here to speak about something that we're actually voting on. So uh, again, there were four meetings earlier throughout the day that we had as a full body, and those items are listed on the agenda. So if you're here to speak about something we're voting on, now's an opportunity to come forward. All right, seeing none, I'm gonna, oh. <clears throat> Good evening, fellow citizens. This is the House of the People. Watchdog Miller reporting. Welcome to uh, uh, Simon the Green Square, where uh, our uh, Catholic and Black city bus routes are banned and uh, buried beneath the wealthy viaducts. Uh, you, uh, somebody excused. You must have voted. I presumably you voted to excuse uh, Alan. Uh, if you're here for housing, he's the number one problem in the housing town. Uh, housing. He's hogging unfathomable number of houses. Uh, his, his job is to bring in a farm. I call him One Farm Allen. In a good year, he brings in Mr. one farm. It's Mr. A, Miller, are you speaking on something that we're voting on tonight? Yes, you voted. Well, uh, we don't know. What, I'm speaking on what you voted on earlier. Presumably, you excuse Allen. He's the main problem housing uh, in, in this city. Uh, and so he deserves excuse for nothing. He also won't, uh, he's, he's opposed uh, uh, black bus routes from his own neighborhood uh, coming down here to our city hall, which makes it more inconvenient. So it's a normal drill. The agenda is a comic book, comic book, uh, no dollar figures, 22 major items. Uh, with no dollar figures, uh, again tonight, uh, you're cheating uh, a gal named Mandy Mindy, who's worked in the city clerk's office 26, 27 years, outworks all of you, and uh, you are have a historic hostility towards hard work in City Hall. If she were sitting up there, all the dollar figures would be in there up and down, uh, up and down the line. So how are we supposed to work with this? Uh, when you uh, uh, fail to give people like uh, Mindy consideration for city clerk, uh, uh, then uh, you're sending a message all around City Hall, nice day out in City Hall. Everybody walks out, you know, almost everybody walks out in City Hall. You can't find anybody to do this. It's a nice day. So the consequences of uh, failing to consider some a wonderful worker, labored, slaved away for decades in the city clerk's office on 4-2. Uh, next, I, I see the uh, uh, coffee fellow is, is up, uh, and uh, he's on 224 winner right now. The number one problem with that is how do you fill that? You're, you're going to need another tax uh, write-off to fill that space, and uh, there's no problem in coffee. I've heard over 3,000 presentations from fellow citizens come up here, and nobody's complaining about coffee, okay? Why does he get a tax break? Uh, a couple of years ago, he, pulled, he didn't want to be in these districts. Now he thinks uh, tax breaks are a really great thing. And uh, as I told you before, 
Uh, the FBI took the McDonald's to court. Uh, McDonald's sued because uh, some 24 uh, FBI uh, McDonald's insiders uh, made over $1 million. Those records are like, locked up. Uh, but still, it's about 84 for all day coffee there. Wendy's and Arby's are 48 and 53 cents. Thank you. Thank you, each. Mr. Miller. Thank you. All right. Anyone else who wishes to be heard on an item that we're voting on tonight? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close that opportunity for public comment, and that will take us to approval of our minutes. <coughs> Commissioners, can I get a motion to approve our minutes from March 6th? So moved. Support. All right, any questions, comments, additions? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? It carries. All right, next that will take us to petitions and communications. We have a communication received from Linda Ortman expressing opposition to the proposed zoning tax amendments. That is received and filed. A communication received from East Hills Council of Neighbors with a list of three positions regarding affordable housing. That is received and filed. Our third communication was received from Stephen Thames expressing opposition to the proposed rezoning of, on Michigan Avenue. That is received and filed. Mm -hmm. Our fourth communication was received from Dustin Havinga with recommendations for zoning changes related to housing. That is received and filed. Our fifth communication was received from Sandra Doker. Decoker. Decoker, sorry. Expressing concerns for the housing now recommendations. That is received and filed. Our sixth communication is from Andrew Stobe submitting his resignation from the North Quarter Corridor Improvement District Board. That will be referred to Committee on Appointments. Our seventh communication is received from Catherine McMahon expressing opposition to the zoning proposals. That is received and filed. <coughs> Excuse me. Our eighth communication is from Tim Kelly regarding his resignation from the City Planning Commission. And that is also referred to the Committee on Appointments. And finally, we've had uh, 41 communications received regarding the Housing Now proposals. And that is also received and filed. All right, next that will take us to reports of city officers. <coughs> Water. Oh, good. Thank you. The city clerk submitted a letter of notification from American Medical Response announcing rates for ambulance services effective March 1st, 2018. That is received and filed. The comptroller's report for the period of February 28th, 2018 through March 20th, 2018 and the amount of $25,090,350.58. That is received and filed. We have the comptroller's small claims report for February 2018. That is received and filed. We have the comptroller's February travel report and revised travel policy. And that is received and filed. We have the Treasurer's Report for period of February 24th, 2018 through March 16, 2018. That is received and filed. And the City of Grand Rapids Quarterly Investment Report for the quarter ending December 31st, 2017. And that is also received and filed. All right, next that will take us to our consent agenda. So our consent agenda, uh, what you will find when you look at the consent <coughs> agenda are items that we talked about this morning in one of our four standing committee meetings. So we have the appointments committee, we have community development, we have fiscal, and then we have committee of the whole. And at those meetings, we discuss, discuss each of those items and then we vote on them. And any item that we vote on unanimously goes to the consent agenda. And then tonight, with one voice vote, we'll adopt those items. So can I get a motion for the consent agenda? So moved. Uh, commissioners, any comments, questions? It was a full day for all of us. All right. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? It carries. All right. So next, that will take us to ordinances to be adopted, and we have two ordinances before us tonight. Our first ordinance, amending section 4.5 of ordinance 2016-88, Establishment of a new classification, Senior Golf Course Greenskeeper. All right. Can I get a motion? So. Support. Yeah. All right. Commissioner Park, you want to tell us about this? So, yes. The, over the last year, HR and the Parks Department went through all the, the positions and classifications at the Indian Trails Golf Course and realized that there wasn't one that was quite meeting what we had for the very top position, so they created this new classification. <laughs> Thank you. Commissioners, any questions or comments? All right, hopefully it'll be warm enough to golf soon. <laughs> yes. 
All right, and this is a roll call vote tonight. Commissioner Kelly. Yes. Commissioner Jones. Yes. Commissioner Lanier. Yes. Commissioner O'Connor. Yes. Commissioner Rapart. Yes. And Mayor Bliss. Yes. And that will take us to our second ordinance tonight. This ordinance is amending section one of the budget ordinance 2017-36 for fiscal year 2018, and this is amendment number 16. All right, can I get a motion? So moved. Bart. All right, Commissioner Jones, you wanna tell us about this? Yes, Mayor, we had uh, two items on the uh, budget amendment, um, for budget amendment on this morning in fiscal. One was for a developer, a developer deposit um, for a parking ramp being built by GVSU and Spectrum uh, for cost incurred for services. Um, and the other was uh, for the Ottawa Avenue extension um, for, uh, with regards to appropriate funding received from the Michigan Department of Transportation. Great. Pretty straightforward. And yes, indeed. All right. Yep. Any Set. questions, comments? All right, this is a roll call vote. Commissioner Jones? Yes. Commissioner Lanier? Yes. Commissioner O'Connor? Yes. Commissioner Rapart? Yes. Commissioner Kelly? Yes. And Mayor Bliss? Yes. And can I get a motion to give this immediate effect? So moved. moved. Support. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? <coughs> it carries. <coughs> All right, so next that will take us to our public hearings tonight. These are the scheduled public hearings, and the very first one before us is a public hearing to consider a Brownfield Amendment to uh, for 449 Bridge Street Development, LLC, and this is located at 449, 453, 457, 499 Bridge Street, Northwest. Some of us think about this as the old Red Lion project. Uh, so we will start this public hearing with a presentation from Kara Wood, our Economic Development Director, and then we'll see if anyone from the development uh, team wants to come and say a few words, and then we'll open it up for public comment. So. Thank you. Tonight's public hearing is regarding a brownfield redevelopment project where a developer is proposing to demolish the current vacant existing building and surface parking lot that you see here. This renovation would include a new restaurant lounge on the first floor, that would have about, about 10,000 square feet, and second through fifth floors would contain 44 studio and one bedroom apartments. 30% of the apartments will be income restricted to households earning approximately 80% of area median income or below. The rents for these units will range from $750 to $996 per month. And the remainder of the units would be rented at market rates, estimated to be between $800 and $1,250 per month. These market rate rental rates fall, fall above the 80% and below 120% of area median income based on the rent limits in Kent County. The development team estimates that 38 new full-time equivalent jobs will be created and the wages for those jobs will range from $15 to $30 per hour. Total investment pro um, for the project is $11.4 million with hard construction costs of $8.9 million. The developer is seeking reimbursement through the Brownfield Redevelopment Program for eligible activities totaling $1.8 million. These costs include the cost for environmental activities, asbestos abatement, demolition, site preparation, and public infrastructure improvements at the site. This reimbursement is expected to occur over a 24-year period of time. This project meets one of the city's investment criteria in the Brownfield policy. Due to the proportion of housing units, 30% are proposed to be restricted to affordable rates for 80% AMI household, as I mentioned earlier. This is exciting. It's one step in the right direction according to our recent policy amendments. And the, as a result, this entitles the developer to a reduction in the annual Brownfield administration fee from 10% 10, from 10 down to 5%. The project has received support from the DDA, although it's not in the tax capture district. It was also presented to West Grand Neighborhood Association who has voted in support. John Ball area neighbors also reviewed the project and they chose not to support the project for a couple of concerns, citing the concentration of businesses selling and serving alcohol on Bridge Street, as well as a business with live music and outdoor seating. In addition, the project is located near the boundaries of the West Side Corridor Improvement District Authority and they too voted in support of the project at their December meeting. This project has received approval from the Planning Commission for a special land use request and also has been reviewed by the Economic Development Project team. I'd be glad to answer any questions that you might have on the project or invite the development team representatives up to add to the conversation. 
All right. Commissioners, any questions for Kara? So we have tonight Greg Lobdell representing the development team and also um, his consultants both on the brownfield and the environmental side. Great. Welcome. Thank you. I'm uh, Greg Lobdell with Three Mission Design and Development. Just want to thank you for your consideration and time looking at this project. Um, we've been working hard on it. On the west side, we're um, just to note a couple of the things that were mentioned. Um, we did um, acquire this property in a time of transitional zoning for this area, and then we've worked really hard to develop something that fits in with the new zoning that has um, where in this area and also that to note that the uh, restaurant use that we have on the first floor we've got a couple of concepts for that but our um, north north uh, cook shop is very much um, related to our North Peak Brewing Company which is a uh, gastro pub features um, craft beer but it's also a family restaurant and we've won in Traverse City um, awards for family restaurant of the year so that gives, I don't know, some kind of idea of what we have planned for it, but ma mainly just want to thank you for your consideration and our team is here for any further questions as well. Okay. Commissioners, any questions? All right. So thank you for being here. If you want to take a seat, we'll open it up for public comment and then if there are questions raised that you can answer, I'll refer back to you and see if you'll come back up. Uh, so if you're here tonight to be heard on this project and this proposal, you can come up. Are you here to speak on this? And I, can I remind Regarding you? the new apartments that are going in the Bridge Street area and other places around town, uh, I want to bring up the fact that at one time we had affordable housing at the wide MCA downtown and at the Morton House, which no longer exist. I would also like to point out the fact that within the past year or so, I saw interviewed on television a young man who worked downtown uh, he was asked if he would like to live downtown, and I consider the Bridge Street area now a part of downtown. And his response was, I can't afford the rents, and I make too much money to qualify for the subsidized housing. Yeah. And ma'am, I'm sorry, can you share your name? Uh, and, and then if you, if you would share verbally, and then if you could... Sharon Milanowski. Thank you, Sharon. And could you write it down? Thank you. This is a new process, so I may have to remind a few folks when you come up. Uh, we just want to make sure that we get people's names right. Thank you. All right, others who wish to be heard on this uh, Brownfield plan uh, request? Hello, my name is Martha Cooper. I live in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, You've heard me complain before about the affordable housing that most governments put in at 60% of AMI, and you all made the decision to put it in at 80% of AMI. And so this is the first time I've been at one where I'm now hearing developers getting up and asking for brownfield development credits to put up buildings where they'll be making profit. Um, and that profit isn't going to really be a for, uh, pr providing affordable housing. I noticed that there was a little stumbling around because uh, you're calling it 80%, and when you did that, you labeled it affordability, housing affordability. So it would be really great if that's the decisions you make, that when you come up here and you speak about these 30% uh, of those apartments going in, that you now continue to call it affordability because it's still not affordable. Thank you. All right, others who wish to be heard? All right, anyone else? Okay, seeing none, I will go ahead and close that public hearing, and this will be referred back to Committee of the Whole. 
All right, so next that will take us to our public hearing on proposed zoning ordinance text amendments related to the sale of alcohol for off-premise consumption and other miscellaneous amendments. So I am going to start this public hearing with Suzanne Schultz, ask her to come forward uh, and tee this up. And then if you're here to speak to this after Suzanne uh, shares some information, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> uh, after Suzanne shares some information, I'll open it up for public comment. Good Hi. evening. Hi. Uh, so these amendments are not part of the housing now. That will be the next public hearing. The, these proposed amendments, um, some of them are miscellaneous cleanup items from the zoning ordinance rewrite that we did last year. Um, as you know that we updated the zoning ordinance and um, there was a number of little tweaks that we've done uh, since the 2017. Most were emissions that um, needed to be corrected. One item that was listed on the housing now recommendations and that was brought up by Commissioner Lanier was the idea that um, Plainfield, 28th Street, and Alpine should be considered as redevelopment opportunities. And in this portion of the text amendments, uh, we included provisions that would allow for any residential use along those corridors to be administratively approved. So that portion of the text amendment is included in this section uh, tonight. Regarding the alcohol uses, uh, we went through a series of meetings on November 14th, November 28th, and December 19th talking about changes that are occurring um, due to MLCC as well as State of Michigan uh, changes. Specifically, the uh, State of Michigan changed the provision that allows for gas stations to sell beer and wine. And then the MLCC also repealed the half mile rule, which requires a separation between liquor stores. So we uh, took this to the, the city commission. We had a lot of discussions. Um, some of the proposed changes to the ordinance would include universal requirements that any new alcohol use has a SEPTED plan reviewed by Grand Rapids Police Department vice unit. Uh, so the crime prevention through environmental design review is really to ensure the safety of both patrons and the public. Um, so cash register viewing windows, things like that, things that we already have in the code. We designed the code when we wrote it with SEPTED in mind, but this adds an additional step just to double check with vice unit. We've had several party stores, for example, really benefit from that review regarding shelf height and where the cash register is placed. So this would formalize that. Um, a good neighbor plan is also included as something that would be required. Uh, the, we've talked about the good neighbor plan before. The ordinance language is included, and that would be an amendment to the ordinance as well. Um, and then there are standard requirements for window coverings and facade transparency and, um, and signage would also be um, just kind of a reminder and included as a universal requirement. The components that we discussed with the alcohol was what would be, uh, what would be allowed for administrative review and approval versus Planning Commission special land use. Um, we debated a lot about what would be ancillary sales. So for example, right now with restaurants that close before midnight, we allow alcohol sales as like another beverage offering. Uh, it's not a bar, it's serving food. And so we right now administratively approve those requests. If they want to go past to 2 a.m., uh, if they're not serving food, other items, then it's a special land use. So we went through a similar exercise with the city commission and then the planning commission for off-premise sales. So the, the to-go sale of beer, wine, or liquor, and what would constitute a, a place where you could have administrative approval. What the decision was made, what administrative approval might be allowed for would be for an SDM license, which is only beer and wine, not liquor. Uh, the, the ordinance amendment that the city commission heard uh, was that the store would close before 11 p.m. Sunday through Thursday and 12 a.m. on Friday and Saturday. The planning commission and their recommendation to you has recommended that it be a consistent 12 a.m. So no differentiation on school nights versus weekend nights. Proximity, uh, that has stayed the same. Uh, if the proximity is located at least 300 feet away, or I'm sorry, 500 feet away from a residential zone district, park, or school, as measured along the linear frontage of the street, um, then if it's outside of that 500 feet away from those zones, then it could be administratively approved as within, it would be a special land use. Uh, the sales area, 2% or less of gross floor area is dedicated to alcohol sales with less than 16 square feet of shelf space and no more than two cooler doors. We could look at that from an administrative standpoint as well if they're, as if they're um, meeting the healthy corner store requirements. 
Um, the big difference between what the City Commission had reviewed for this and what the Planning Commission had recommended is that the concentration of licenses, uh, this Planning Commission has recommended that there be no concentration requirement. Uh, when the City Commission discussed this, you looked at how many would be acceptable within a certain radius and um, defined both for special land use as well as administrative approval. The Planning Commission is recommending striking all of the concentration requirements. So I think that's the, those are the big ones. The other, there was one other addition that the Planning Commission made to add drug and alcohol rehab facilities into the separation requirements in addition to schools and uh, residential districts. All right. Thank you, Suzanne. Okay. Um, commissioners, any questions for Suzanne before I open this up for public comment? Our, oh, Commissioner? Just a quick one. So, Suzanne, um, help us to understand um, the rationale behind um, the Planning Commission repeatedly um, making recommendations that are contrary to what the Commission has already vocalized as their um, preference. Um, just help, is, is there something, is there any insight that you can provide? I did express to the Planning Commission that there was concern, but it was a recommendation by the City Commission to have the concentration in there. Um, so they were made aware of it. I think they, I can't speak for the Planning Commission, um, but I think they felt that it wasn't necessary, so they recommended against it. Because in addition to that, we were also, because we had instituted the moratorium that by that evening had been reversed, and um, as a result, we were, um, at least my understanding was that um, administratively you all would be, because you knew where the commission stood, you would be administrating um, many of the practices that we were hoping to have in a policy upcoming. And so to kind of, so if that has been the case, then this is even contrary to what administratively has been in practice in recent months as we've been kind of discussing this issue. But I, I think you're right. I, I don't think it's your place probably to, to respond to them. It's probably more of conversations that we need to have directly with the Planning Commission um, about what's going on there because it just seems like we're just on opposite sides of every issue. Um, and that's giving me concern because we'll, we'll make a recommendation. It'll go to the Planning Commission. And I, even these housing now, um, recommendations that are coming forth are, you know, contrary to some of the information that we had sent over to the Planning Commission. So it just, it's just becoming um, quite difficult to digest for me personally, but thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. All right. But I would like the list of Planning Commission and their contact information and their term dates, please. Sure. Oh, yeah, thank we you. can provide that. <laughs> That is all. Please, no clapping. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick really firmly to the rules tonight because I want people to feel respected in this space because that's really important to all of us. Uh, but that is, that is available, and it's, and it's online, too. Yep, yep we have that. Um, the, one, the one thing on the concentration piece, um, you may recall that we did debate the, in the administrative review if it is an ancillary, it's a, if it's the two cooler doors and less than 2%. Um, I think that was an area of debate of whether or not there was a need to worry about concentration of businesses if the sales <laughs> area was small and very limited. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be under the administrative approval. Mm -hmm. But anything else, that's where we had a concentration for Planning Commission review to consider. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, we had added based on City Commission discussion, concentration also to the admin review. So I think there's some areas in there that we can discuss further. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Anything else, Commissioners? All right, so I will open up this opportunity for public comment. And this is if you're specifically here to speak about the uh, text amendments that Suzanne just referred to. So the miscellaneous amendments as well as the uh, sale of alcohol for off-premise consumption. All right, so I'll open up this public hearing. If you're here to speak on this, please come up. Same rules apply. Uh, we'll give you three minutes to speak. We ask that you write down your name as well as the city that you live in. Good evening, mayors, commissioners. My name is Josh Hunger. I'm a resident of Grand Rapids, and I have the pleasure of representing the 2,400 members of the Grand Rapids Chamber. 
Um, I'm not going to be able to get to all the details uh, in the three-minute shot clock, but I do want to thank Suzanne um, and her team for the work they've done this uh, since the moratorium was first discussed uh, three months ago or whatever. I think it was November. Um, as since that time, we've engaged with a lot of stakeholders, including our members, members of the commission, staff, uh, members of the community, and I've really found a lot of shared goals. As currently written, though, I think we still have a lot of concerns about um, are we really addressing the problem actors that have driven a lot of this versus throwing up obstacles to um, the kind of businesses we're trying to attract to neighborhoods and to parts of the city, including grocers, retailers, uh, and other small businesses that would compete with the bad actors um, that, we have is, ha that we have identified as issues. Um, and I think that gives us an opportunity to maybe take a step back and um, talking with some of our members that do retail, um, the kind of companies we want to work with, there's a lot of alignment and they want to be a part of this and we want to be a part of this and I think we could work with the various community interests to maybe get into the weeds at a different level and try to really say how do we drive at the problems without putting up obstacles to the type of businesses we want to attract. Um, and so I'm very encouraged. I think the last few months has led to a very productive conversation and I hope that we can partner with you. You have our commitment um, to be a good faith partner on trying to evaluate all of what's been proposed and work with you all, staff and other members of the community uh, to try to find a collaborative solution to this. So thank you for your time and I look forward to our next discussion. Thanks. Thank you. All right, others who wish to be heard? Hi, I'm Don Lee, I'm the director of the ECA um, and a member of the Neighborhood Association Collaborative. Um, we just want to state our support for the concentration restrictions and we look forward to discussing the matter with the chamber. <clears throat> Thank you, Don. All right, others who wish to be heard? Hi, my name is Nathan Dufine, resident of Grand Rapids, Southeast, Ward 3. Uh, you know, listening to this, okay, so the concentration rule, um, I, it seems like a rule on top of a rule. Like, guess what? I was out, I've been doing spring cleaning, I'm cleaning up liquor bottles off the side of the road in the gutter. It's not due to the concentration of liquor stores. It's a cultural problem. It's a broader cultural problem. It's lack of enforcement, okay, against littering. Okay, we do have problems with liquor stores. Let's, let's fo focus on the enforcement, making sure the stores are upkept well, that they're doing the right thing. Okay, let's not try to go this back door and say, well, if there's too high of a concentration, then, then bad things are just bound to happen because that's, that's not logical, that's not reasonable, there's no, that doesn't follow that necessarily a higher concentration would bring more problems. The, the issue we're looking at is that if the people are littering, liquor stores, needles, condoms on the ground, whatever, okay, that is an issue into itself, and that's an enforcement issue. That's not necessarily an issue of, okay, well, the concentration is too high. And th this kind of thinking that we're going to regulate something like the concentration and that that's going to have some kind of downstream effect on the br gr broader culture or, or, or what's happening in our society, that's backwards thinking. You're reversing the causality. Okay, if we want to stop littering, if we want people to live up to a higher standard, we've got to, we've got to show that higher standard. We've got to clean up the city. We've got to put money towards street repairs, okay, so people don't see broken curbs and broken streets and they just throw the liquor bottle on the ground because, hey, ain't no one cleaning up anyway. So I, I would like to see actionable items on what we can do as far as enforcement, facade improvement, whatever, I don't know, whatever problems people are thinking is going to come from 
you know, a, a liquor store or a bar or microbrew. I'm a member of High Five Co-op. The building owners won't even talk to us. We've got zero help from the city on this. Okay, not to mention uh, cannabis dispensaries for medical patients, which have to drive an hour to Lansing. I know that's not on the issue, but it, it's this same mindset that we're going to regulate something up here and we're going to set down a bunch of strict rules. And by virtue of that, that's going to create some kind of moral or philosophical enlightenment. It's not. Let's let's get the causality straight. Let's start talking to Lansing about these issues, funding for housing, whatever it is, a state bank. There's a lot of different issues where we've got to break beyond our bonds of what just your job description is, and you got to start leading the community. you got to make Grand Rapids a leader out there going to Lansing and say, Lansing, we can't do this alone. Detroit can't. Flint can't. Give us some help. Let's off-flip the people. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. All right, others who wish to be heard? Are you coming up, Mr. Miller? What's up, Miller back? Uh, Miller's go back to 1879 here on the, west, on the west side of Grand Rapids. Uh, uh, Grand Rapids is always known as a city of churches, even uh, when I came back for good, maybe uh, 15 plus years ago, you could drive down the freeways and you would see one church after another. That's been destroyed by all of Hartwell's crude uh, uh, billboards. In terms of planning uh, commission, these are all um, Mayor Bliss appointees. I don't want to know her, I, her address, I would not divulge it, but I think everybody else on the planning committee uh, should be that should be listed in these handouts you know where do they live in it that, that looks concentrated and it's very crude to uh, 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 concentrate uh, these these beer joints with a fancy store uh, named party store in neighborhoods uh, it should be going the other direction show them down eight nine o'clock at night if they're only within a half a mile of the school district uh, instead of going uh, I guess you are going to 12 and then he Concentration concerns. I'm fully support uh, Commissioner Lanier's concerns, and also some of a couple of speakers earlier on the Bridge Street. Uh, the it seems like affordable number goes up. Uh, uh, all, now it's 80 percent, and using averages, not uh, means or median income. So uh, th thank you very much. I would just like to say uh, one of my aunts. Uh, uh, would uh, and her uh, marvelous uh, uh, activists of her era uh, went to every uh, uh, public meeting to make sure when the expressways plowed through, not a single Catholic church would knock down. That's why 196 goes like this. And uh, I mean, the neighborhood people were respected in that era. We just don't see that now. Who are these mysterious planning people? All Rosalind Bliss's appointees are now at the Hartwell crowd is gone. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Mr. Miller. All right, others who wish to be heard? Okay, seeing none, I'm gonna go ahead and close that public hearing. And that will be, let me see, referred back to Committee of the Whole. All right, next that will take us to our third public hearing tonight. And this is a public hearing on proposed zoning ordinance text amendments related to implementation of Housing Now. And these are recommendations three, six, eight, and nine. So I'm gonna have Suzanne come back up and just tee this one up for us and give us a little background. And then if you are here to speak to that tonight, I'll uh, open up the public hearing as soon as Suzanne is done. So I'll first say, uh, just a reminder for everybody, we have comment cards in the back. So if you run out of things, you didn't have enough time with your three minutes, you want to say something or you don't want to speak, um, but you want to still comment, you can fill out the comment cards and you can take as many as you'd like. So um, we just wanted to remind people of that. Thank you. The, the um, Amy reminded me. I, <laughs> thank you for I that reminder. I didn't want to forget, so I thought I'd extra up here too if we need more. <laughs> uh, so this, uh, I'll just very short and sweet. The um, this would uh, is the public hearing for Housing Now Re Plan Recommendations three, six, eight, and nine. Um, they were considered by the Planning Commission, and there were some amendments that were made. I'll briefly go through each uh, one, just really quick, just so you have it. The housing. Um, Recommendation number three was incentives for small-scale development, so this is for missing middle development. Uh, several recommendations include reducing the minimum dwelling unit width from 18 feet to 14 feet, 
allowing the construction of two family residential developments with administrative approval in the LDR zone district with, uh, when located on a corner. Um, what was proposed was 100 feet from a mixed use commercial zone district. The planning commission recommended changing that to 500 feet. Uh, eliminating the minimum lot area requirement of 20,000 square feet for multifamily residential developments and then um, allowing the construction of developments um, within that what would be the 500 foot area. Design guidelines were also discussed. The Planning Commission um, recommended that uh, design guidelines not be advanced. However, uh, if resources were allocated by the City Commission for such function, they would, they would support that. Uh, the second one was Housing Advisory Committee recommendation number six, density bonus for the development of affordable housing. Um, and basically this would allow affordable housing bonus uh, for re in residential districts and mixed use commercial districts where they're located um, as part, well, just basically when it's hitting a certain income level. Part of the recommended uh, language was to, um, for a distance adjacent to transit and the number of units. The Planning Commission felt that that was not necessary and recommended removal of those um, portions of the proposed language. They did add um, recommending a, a failure to perform clause with penalties for non-compliance if affordability was not maintained and that an annual reporting and price thresholds be recorded through the deed uh, so that that would uh, be maintained and pretty much memorialized as part of getting those bonuses. Housing Advisory Committee recommendation number eight was for accessory dwelling units by right. Um, this would modify the minimum lot area and uh, building height for ADUs, as well as allowing a two-story attached de a detached ADU, so like if you wanted to have a, a flat above a garage. Uh, this would allow it, as I believe I mentioned, uh, with administrative approval in all residential zone districts, the Planning Commission recommended the suggested language as presented. And then finally, the Housing Advisory Committee recommendation number nine for non-condo zero lot line units. Uh, this would permit attached single-family residential dwellings with administrative approval in a low-density residential zone where specific criteria is met. Uh, what was proposed is four, four units or less attached um, within 100 feet. The Planning Commission is recommending eight or less attached units and within 500 feet of a mixed-use commercial zone district. Uh, we also uh, propose reducing the minimum dwelling unit width from 18 feet to 14 feet and allowing the dwelling unit width to control the size of the lot. So those were the uh, major recommendations. You have received additional comment in response to the City Commission's um, discussion when we set the public hearing for data. The Planning Department has prepared the data compendium uh, for informed housing policy. <laughs> I heard it was you. <laughs> We gave it a fancy name, why not? Uh, lots of charts and maps. Uh, you have uh, information that was requested by Commissioner O'Connor in here for vacant lots and demolitions and blight monitoring uh, is located in here, um, as well as information on the LIHTC program when those uh, might be expiring, uh, just to give you a sense of where we have affordable housing now and it might change. Uh, and then also the demographics of the community and equity discussion pieces that have been occurring in the community. Finally, the City Commission also had questions about special land use in that process, master plan, area specific plans, and so this document also contains that background. So Suzanne, I will start by saying thank you for pulling that together. I read it over the weekend uh, and it was incredibly informative uh, and I know it took a lot of work. Uh, so thank you, appreciate that. Uh, Commissioner? I just uh, want to publicly say, uh, Suzanne, awesome job on the, uh, the compendium. And like the mayor, this is the first time I've ever seen that word in my life. Uh, <laughs> I had to look it up. Know what the compendium was, <laughs> you know what it is now. But uh, kudos to you and the staff. I think that you did a, uh, a marvelous job of providing context above and beyond, especially from a historical sense as well as um, from, the, from a, a context around, uh, around race and class. So I really, really appreciate everything that went into this because I find it to be very, very helpful. So thank you. Yeah, agreed. Commissioner? Yeah, I add, want to add my thanks. And, and the interactive maps are really helpful as well, Suzanne. So I know you put a ton of hours into this and didn't get much sleep. Um, and it was also really great to have our data from the Great Housing Strategies mm -hmm. updated from Zimmerman Bulk as well. Now we have a span of time to look at, mm -hmm. and that's very helpful. So thank you so much. And, and your staff as well. Please pass on our thanks. Yeah, well. thanks. Commissioner? 
Yes, Suzanne, thank you so much for putting this together. Um, I have not had a chance to read through all of it. Um, I did start reading it, but I'm, I have a question about the fees. I know that that was one of the questions that we asked during that last um, work session, you know, what are the costs? Can you help me to find that in here? Yep, so that will be on um, page, I'm looking here, 91 has the special land use process. Okay. And it's what, 1925 is that right? Yep. Well, $1,975. Um, okay. The City Commission's directive, it's part of your directive for full cost recovery. The general operating fund currently subsidizes 12% of the cost of a special land use request. <coughs> Costs include uh, hearing notices, recording secretary staff time and resources to support the function. And then, so we, in addition to that, we were talking about um, the possibility of not only reducing the, the special land use fees, but also reducing the requirement that it would require a developer to so for example some of the concerns that developers have shared um, are all surrounding what they need in order to get the approval so they would need to spend you know ten thousand dollars on an architect to get the renderings and things of that nature in order to get um, the approval so part of I, I know for me personally that part of one of my questions has been how do we reduce what it is that they need, um, the requirement that they need, um, so that they're not, if we don't necessarily have to do things by right, but we're reducing the requirement of, of that, so that they don't have to spend so much money in order to get to a place where they can get their approval, and then with community engagement. Because I think what I've been hearing is the issue is, we don't wanna spend that much money and then have to go through community engagement to hear a no. So how do we reduce that barrier without eliminating um, the need for the community to weigh in on, mm -hmm. on some of the housing, um, unique housing options that are listed here? Yeah, and I think on, so uh, first question, the, on pages 93 and 94, mm -hmm. um, I highlighted what's in yellow that we were typical special land use requirements and then other things that get submitted at LUDs after they know they have their approval. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. I think it, the question is, is how much do, does the public need or staff need to be able to know if a project is feasible? Mm -hmm. So for example, we just had a project that was at Planning Commission and the parking lot layout didn't have the setback dimensions and other things. And it turns out when it actually lays it out, it's not feasible, but the neighborhood had supported the project thinking that that was the project. So there's always kind of this, like we need enough information to make an educated decision mm -hmm. um, versus how much, in, you know, how much is excessive where we don't want them spending additional resources that aren't needed. Mm -hmm. um, so over time we've tried to kind of parse that out. It may not be full. We don't require, for example, floor plans for, um, a, for a project. Sometimes it's instructive. Um, but they don't need to fully engineer a building to be able to come to the Planning Commission. Okay. So if we have an idea of what the building setbacks are, the building envelope, uh, the schematics, sometimes with community engagement, the neighborhood might have different ideas of what should be designed. Mm -hmm. And that's usually um, where we see additional kind of reiterations of, of that work. And so that's also the kind of the, the, you know, the level between community engagement and just having administrative approvals. So that's always the tension in um, how much engagement happens and how many changes are expected. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to Could comment you? on that too. Thank you, Mayor. Um, we have talked also in this group about the possibility of waiving fees for those uh, those affordable. individuals, those those developers, for-profit or non-profit, that are actually doing affordable housing, or at least a percentage of it, if there's a percentage in the building. Um, I actually had a developer suggest that we might just add a fee in order to put some money into the uh, trust fund. We cannot do that under Correct. state law because of Bolt versus Lansing. But now we're investigating the possibility. We had a conversation with some of our neighborhoods, uh, Commissioner O'Connor and I did the other day, about how developers want certainty, they want to know what to, what to expect, but um, they might be willing to um, pay on a sliding scale, depending on the, the scale of the project itself. So that we're investigating now. So there are some options that we might be able to consider once we get some 
legal opinions on those? Yeah, our, our building fees are set by the level of investment. Mm -hmm. um, we could certainly look at that. I think it's what that expectation is for the cost recovery. Right, yep. exactly. So we could kind of make up for those projects that are really going to have the true affordability and, and, and still hopefully provide the certainty that developers want. I think what was interesting uh, when we look at the special land use approvals that 8% of all permits actually come through special land use, 92% is administratively approved. Of all of the housing units, which I didn't know until I started doing this this process, and it's, it's on page, I'll have to find it, but um, of all of the units, the multifamily units that we approved, uh, Two-thirds of the multifamily units that have been constructed since 2011 were administratively approved and one-third were, were at Planning Commission. Of that one-third, it was draw only drawn by about a third of those projects um, were basically from three large developments that had 650 units of housing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that data was, was very helpful. Yeah. So I also I do want to say thank Kristen Turkelson's here, Landon's here, uh, Lou Canfield, Phil Shafts, my Aaron Banchoff, uh, Paul and Paula Jasper, Becky Joe uh, Glover, John Overman, Dylan Postma, and Zach Teal. All um, we, it's a village, so we all work together. Thank you. Thank you to the whole team. Mm -hmm. so, yep. All right. Anything else, commissioners? Before I open up for public comment. All right. Thank you, Suzanne. All right, so if you are here tonight to speak on uh, one or more of these recommendations, you can come on up again. And, and ma'am, if you already uh, signed your name, you don't have to sign it twice, okay? I live in the Richmond Park area, and if this rezoning goes through, from Alpine up to one block from where my house is, and I'm one block, I'm just around the block from Richmond Park, will be zoned commercially. Uh, the area I live in, I grew up in, I went away, I came back, I'm currently living there. I saw the area and my neighborhoods going through transitions and I now see a positive transitions within the last year and a half. Three of rental properties have now been, now are privately owned, single family dwellings. And I see that happening, and it's one of the few areas in the city that has affordable housing for people looking for homes. They're 70-year-old homes, but they're affordable compared to what's in other neighborhoods. I also know that in the Richmond Park area, whenever a school has an event, no one in the neighborhood can park anywhere but in their driveway, and they're lucky if someone doesn't park in their driveway and block them. This happens in the springtime and in the fall for track meets and other various activities. I don't think anyone in the neighborhood really minds that. However, if we zone for multifamily units, this is what's going to be happening, as one of these things that was passed out to us earlier. I'm totally against this. As far as I'm concerned, a commercially zoned area could mean a factory. Just because you are wanting to rezone it to put in some housings, and I have no idea how high those buildings could go, uh, how much of it is going to be used for parking space, but I know that some people who moved in just recently into the neighborhood did not know when we're surprised to find out that they are going to be living one block away from commercially zoned areas. They moved into that area because it was a good family area. Traffic is not high in that area. It's not like it was when I was growing up, of course, but it's not high. Kids can still cross the street there for the most part and not have to worry about it. If this goes through, that's not going to happen. I have no idea what it's going to mean to property values. I have no idea what it's going to mean to taxes. And as far as I'm concerned, I could be living, living across from the city dump trucks because it's a commercially zoned area. You could put in anything you want. Thank you. Thank you. All right, others wish to be heard? Hi, my name is Angelique Dufine. I live in Grand Rapids. I'm here representing Garfield Park Neighborhoods Association, and I have a letter to read from the board. The Board of Directors of Garfield Park Neighborhoods Association supports the zoning changes proposed in response to the recommendations made by the Housing Now Advisory Panel. The board would like to thank the Planning Commission staff for their work assembling the data compendium for informed housing policy. We were able to use this information to educate more than 20 neighbors at a community meeting last night. During the following discussion, 
we recognized the citywide crisis of housing supply and affordable housing and evaluated their impact on our neighbors and our neighborhood. Garfield Park Asso neighborhood Association is the second largest neighborhood in the city, representing more than 5,000 households from a broad range of ethnic, economic, and educational backgrounds. We are proud of the diversity of our neighborhood, and our goal is to preserve the ability for people of all incomes and backgrounds to be in our neighbor neighborhood. Unfortunately, our neighborhood and 49507 zip code bear the imprint of decades of lack of investment, blight, vacant lots, and the highest number of children with lead poisoning in the state. Our neighborhood has seen few new housing units, yet home and rental prices continue to rise. Our most vulnerable neighbors are being displaced, and too many of our children live in homes that are poisoning them. The status quo is not acceptable. The incremental zoning changes proposed by the Planning Commission are a good first step to help address the supply crisis by increasing density in a way that minimally impacts neighborhood character while enabling neighborhoods to maintain a diversity of incomes. We anticipate positive impacts from increased density, walkable neighborhoods, more local customers for our business owners, and added viability for transit. Undoubtedly, these changes will not be enough to address the demand for housing units, so the City Commission should monitor their impact and act to further address barriers to housing supply in the zoning code. More importantly, the city's inability to use inclusionary zoning demands a parallel effort to address the housing affordability crisis. Housing supply will not protect our most vulnerable neighbors. It will not ensure the benefits of investment in the city are available to all residents, regardless of income or race. Investment in the Garfield Park neighborhood is desperately needed, but it must be done in a way that supports all our neighbors. We encourage the city commission to speak with clarity on how it plans to ensure the growth of our city is equitable. Thank you. Thank you. Did you want to leave a copy of that? Yeah. OK, thank you. All right, next. Dan Velzen, City of Grand Rapids. I'm a lifelong resident in Grand Rapids. I. Uh, Spent a lot of time around the East Town area. When I was a kid, uh, not many people wanted to live in that area. Uh, my first apartment was on Wealthy, just uh, west of East Town, and my mother almost had a heart attack. Um, but I've seen the uh, I've seen the improvement over the years from the work of a lot of residents and the neighborhood association. So I drew up a little something to read here. Um, Neighborhood associations and involved residents have routinely been touted as a way to build great communities. Given their decades of effort and investment, stripping residents of their input would be a travesty. This proposal aims to give the fox the keys to the hen house. Destroying single family homes to replace them with multi-units not only decreases adjacent property values, but also degrades their peaceful enjoyment. Multiply this action and the neighborhood soon has a different feel with increased inconveniences, including competition for on-street parking. Residents have invested in their homes based on future consistency of the neighborhood where they live. Developers have no personal connection to these communities, nor will they suffer the negative impacts. The affordable, affordable housing shortage is not solved by selling out those residents that live near commercial zones. Now that apartment buildings have consumed virtually every available parcel, often with insufficient parking, developers are salivating over our neighborhoods. The promise of affordable housing is an affront to common sense. Profit is the reason anyone develops multi-units. This is not a moral statement, simply economics. The recent increase in demand has built a fleet of new, aesthetically challenged buildings filled with apartments at rates far from affordable. As with these larger structures, building or converting to a multifamily comes at considerable cost per unit, and anyone investing in such a project will rightfully seek maximum return on investment. This will require building apartments that allow premium pricing. Per occupant, this cannot compete with smaller, simpler apartments and complexes where efficiencies can be maximized. Designing these complexes in less residentially established locations with sufficient space for tenant volume would minimize negative impacts to our neighborhoods and our city as a whole. In conclusion, the residents have elected you to make decisions that will improve our city in the future, cultivate what we cherish in the present, and protect what we preserve from the past. 
this proposal accomplishes none of that. Thanks for your service. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. All right, others who wish to be heard? And thank you for signing your name. <laughs> I signed at lunch because that, that's where I thought we'd stand in line to be able oh, to speak. Oh, well, so good. If it's already covered. signed, perfect. Good evening. Thank you. Um, you know what I should do is go ahead and get this. Oh, we'll hold off on starting your timer. So go ahead if you want to hand those out. Just want to make sure I that. Thank you. Uh, my name is Robert Metzger, and I am the property owner at 312 Prospect Avenue Northeast in Grand Rapids. Uh, it's on Prospect just south of Michigan Avenue. Um, I am probably unique in that I'm here as a paradox tonight, and uh, I'll get into that. But what I'd like to do first is, is mention that um, my property is a 16-unit multi-unit apartment complex right next to a commercial area. Um, my folks built them in a very blighted area of Heritage Hill in 1964. The uh, city assessor actually said to my father that he wished he didn't have to assess anything for what he was doing to the neighborhood. And surprisingly it worked out and it was pretty dicey because it was almost a total financial failure. But things work out and uh, lucky for us we figured out a way to keep it still in the family. So I make the payments. As I said, I'm somewhat a paradox, and I don't know if you got my cover letter to my comments last week, but I actually am supportive of the efforts that the planning department's made. There's a great deal of effort that went into that and thought. Uh, I, I, having read through them and comparing them to my other ordinances and other places I've lived around the country, uh, I've, I've been a war, oh, I guess you call it a, a, a road warrior. So I've spent a lot of time in places, um, Brooklyn, New York, Queens, Seattle, Portland, Oregon, San Diego, many places, but same, some of the same challenges that we're facing here. And surprisingly, there's a consistent thread with some of the choices that have been made here, and I think that's a step in the right direction. As I said, I'm a paradox in that um, I understand why this room is filled with people tonight, and a great many of them, it has to do with fear. And fears are much stronger motivator than greed because people will do anything to make the pain stop. And I guess when I say I'm a paradox, I am what people fear. Oh, and Robert, I'm going to ask you to show them to us oh, only because we ask Here that you oh. speak to us and not the audience. Okay. So, but we, we have them inside our packet. Yes. So. Anyway, my, my, my question, so I don't take up any more time, or my implication would be is if we can put as much effort and thought and energy into enforcing uh, dysfunctional enforcement mechanisms that the city hasn't addressed in decades. And I'll let you read my bullet list that's already included in my package, so I won't take up anybody else's time so other people have a chance to speak. Thank you, Robert. The dog did live, by the way. The uh, dog was almost run over in my parking lot last summer by a Spectrum resident who uh, floored it through the parking lot for no good reason. But he is still alive. We're glad to hear that. Oh, that's right. Thank you. All right, others who wish to be heard? Hi. Hi, Welcome. my name is Matt Fowler, City of Grand Rapids. It often feels like I don't have a voice. In a country based on democracy, it feels like I'm helpless to make the changes I desire to see in my community. But tonight I'm hoping my voice can be heard. And as I look around, I believe I'm speaking for a fair few people here. And if it's true, please stand up so that if, if you hear something you agree with, so that the city officials know that what you are here to stand for. I believe affordable housing is a must in Grand Rapids. I believe we must act soon and do more. I believe affordable housing should be defined as 30% of our income spent on a housing based on 60% area medium income. 
I believe all people deserve safe housing. I believe gentrification is a lack of creativity and, a lack, and, and lacks people in power willing to stand up against greed. I believe in development without displacement. I believe in people over profit. And I believe that this country has, and this city has historically made housing very difficult for certain people and now has an opportunity to right these wrongs. Most importantly, I believe that this is an issue of the heart. And I'm asking that all people here and those listening to search your hearts for what is the right thing to do. Ask yourselves, are you and your personal plans for this city seeking to help all people or just certain people? Possibly just yourself. Are my actions acting in the favor of all people or acting, helping the same people that have been benefiting for some, from systemic and generational privileges for hundreds of years while others have been being walked over and ignored? What side of history do you want to be on? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. All right, others who wish to be heard? Hi. Hi, welcome. Thank you. My name is Samantha Searle. I live in Midtown in Grand Rapids. I'm going to take a different tack. Um, the, I'm going to focus a little bit on the Housing Now Committee itself because I found that to be rather interesting. Um, since they're making a lot of these decisions or recommendations. And I just want to read a few things that I found out. We've partnered with residents and housing developers to recommend progressive housing solutions. That's the first sentence of the second paragraph on the home page of Housing Now. I did some research on the Housing Advisory Committee as well as the individuals directly related to this group, the commissioners and the city employees. I was shocked quite frankly. The recommendations, as you probably well know, but I want to just frame this, the recommendations were presented to the City Commission in December of 2015, the end of the year. Mayor, you appointed the Housing Advisory Committee in 2016, don't have a month. The committee met seven times between October and May, once a month, not including December. That's 15 months total to make these sweeping changes, does that really seem like enough time has been put into this effort? Just to think about it. What I also want to bring up is who are the committee members? And how do they qualify to be speaking for me and the many people sitting in this audience? Did you know that of the 20 Housing Now committee members, three city commissioners, and three advisory city employees that are listed on the website. Approximately seven to 10 live outside Grand Rapids. It's close to a third. Did you know that the same group, there are no neighbors or neighborhood association representatives? Did you know that of that same group, five people own multiple properties? Out of all of this, did you know that only two homes fall into a blue bubble. That doesn't represent me. I don't think that represents anyone here. I need to be represented. I voted on some of you. So did they. I really, really need my vote to count. And I really, really need to be represented. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha. Hello, Hi. I'm Welcome. Lisa Bars. I am representing the Heritage Hill Neighborhood Association. I'm just going to read from the letter that we sent for the people here that you all got, but just to restate. The Heritage Hill Association opposes the proposed zoning ordinance text changes. We believe these code changes are premature and were not properly vetted. The risk of unintended consequences is too great to codify good intentions without the research and necessary data to support what Housing Now purports for the zoning ordinance changes. We urge you to have a vigorous community conversation within the development of the city's master plan. This is the City of Grand Rapids way of engagement, to harness the collective wisdom of our community so that Grand Rapids is strong and a healthy and vital place to live, work, and play. The goal of our city should be incentivizing the development and stabilization of mixed income neighborhoods everywhere in Grand Rapids. There is strong support for diverse and healthy neighborhoods. 
the zoning amendments do not specifically provide or protect affordable housing and will likely concentrate wealth in high demand areas. The process and the text of these proposals have disenfranchised neighbors who have worked so hard to improve their neighborhood and the city. On behalf of the Heritage Hill Association Board, we strongly advocate to continue this conversation with all voices and push it to the master plan. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. Hi. Uh, my name is Nick Dubkowski. I'm with the Crescent Neighborhood Association Board. Um, and echoing some of what's already been said, um, we are actually in support of ordinance number six, uh, or recommendation number six, I should say. Um, but we do think that 389 could use some uh, revision. It's been said previously that resident voice was not uh, overwhelmingly considered here. and. We think that there is space for that to happen. It can happen in the master plan, but it could also happen beforehand with a working group because a master plan process could take years, whereas we might not have years to take. Um, and um, also a note, recommendations three and nine are not even really the result of the working group that we had. They were changed by the planning commission to uh, become a lot broader than their original intention and that doesn't reflect the community input that they've we, has already been received as well as the data that Suzanne put together um, and so I'm not sure why we would or we <laughs> uh, why it would be approved without that input um, so we're asking for 389 to be voted no not necessarily where uh, we need to take four or five years to figure it out. It's, it is a pressing problem, so, uh, but there's lots of neighbors and there are a lot of organizations that want to come up with a solution that is a little more tailored to um, ensuring affordability. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Appreciate that. All right, others who wish to be heard? Hi, my name is Jenny Potoff, and I first want to start out by thanking everyone here. Um, I moved to Grand Rapids about 20 years ago. I now reside in Chelsea, but I still own property here in Grand Rapids. So I'm a landlord, and I have two properties that I love very much, and I take a lot of pride in them. And I recently found out about this whole initiative in the last month, and I was terribly disgruntled, and I am vehemently opposed about this 500 foot right to development. I'm not sure where that number, how you landed on the number, or how whoever that group was that landed on the number of 500. That's, that's a huge, I mean, 100 to 500 is huge. And when I came here to go to graduate school, when I was driving through Grand Rapids, I'm from farm country. So actually, we used to work together <laughs> at the Antlers. Um, but yeah, so I'm from farm country, so I came to Grand Rapids. I went to school up in Sault Ste. Marie, so tiny, tiny. And I was overwhelmed by this huge city, the bright lights, all the churches. I'm like, oh my god, there's a church everywhere. Not, not that, uh, yeah, but anyway, I thought, this place is amazing. Look at all these houses, and there's a neighborhood here, and there's a neighborhood there, and everything was so neat, and the houses were great. And that is what makes our city, and it, it, it just, I can't tell you how upsetting it is to think that they're, they're considering starting to like move in and demolish these neighborhoods. I mean, that, I, I recently, I mean, when I came back to Grand Rapids on a trip not so long ago, I guess it was, it's been a little while now, and I saw what they did with this thing, this monstrosity. I'm sorry, whoever the architect was, that they're on, on Michigan, that big gray, like, what the, doesn't, I don't even know. I'm not sure, but that, like, that's the kind of things that you see happening, and it's alarming. It's alarming. We have a beautiful city, and I want you to consider. Like, I don't. I'm not sure where any of you reside, but I want you. I want to ask you how you would feel if someone came in out of one afternoon. They're not checking with you. They're not checking with their neighborhood, and you find out. Oh, they're putting in a Hardee's or a. Or a 
Big Boy or a McDonald's or a plasma, anything. From what I understand, the right to development means you can do whatever you want to do. And the whole issue of affordable housing, what is affordable housing? If I make $300,000, affordable housing isn't going to be the same to you as it is to some of these people in this neighborhood or in these, and sitting here in this room. And I, I just, please, 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 I'm begging you to please do not pass this. It, it's, it would be like the beginning of the end, I feel like, to this wonderful, beautiful city that so many of us call home. So thank you for your time. I know you'll make the right decision. <laughs> thank you, and good to see you. <laughs> It's a little blast from the past. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. So when I was growing up. <laughs> Hi, welcome. Hi. My name is Jen Gavin. I'm a proud homeowner and proud business Hi, owner and volunteer in the city of Grand Rapids. I also have the honor of serving on the Historic Preservation Commission for the city of Grand Rapids, and I thank you, Mayor and Commissioners, for your time. I'm not here to speak on behalf of the commission, but to speak personally. Um, I understand the premise of this of this zoning change. I understand that we need housing, but I'm not sure that this is the right way to go about it. Um, because of what I do in my volunteer position with you guys, I am concerned about the destruction of the fabric of our neighborhoods if we allow wholesale demolition by right. I'm not sure that everybody who's read this understands that this means that if you're in the blue bubble, someone can buy the house next door to you and put up a large apartment building with multiple units and zero lot lines, which means it goes all the way to the sidewalk and all the way to the edge of its property. Um, this will make it difficult for us to sustain the fabric of our neighborhoods and will reduce, like Jenny said, the charm of our neighborhoods. And I'm not sure that it's 199 properties currently owned by the Kent County Land Bank that have not been developed. Uh, the Housing Now report itself estimates that there will be a demand for 9,375 new homes in the near future. It admits that there are currently 800 under construction and that there are 18,300 vacant housing units. This does not mean that we need to begin knocking down our neighborhoods so that we can put in additional density. There are 238 properties currently on the blight list before the Housing Commission that could be fixed up, and there are 2,479 vacant lots in the city of Grand Rapids. So I would challenge our Housing Department and our Planning Commission to look at the housing stock that we have now to improve it, to use it for housing. It can be affordable housing, and after all, reusing existing housing stock is recycling. So. I, I, I can't support this. I hope that you won't either. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Good Hi. evening. Welcome. My name is Adam DeYoung, and I live in um, Heritage Hill in Grand Rapids. Um, I want to thank you for the time that you put into this. Um, I think you've had a lot of effort from everybody. <laughs> and I think there's, this is a sensitive topic, and I just want to speak a little bit into my opinion of that as well. I think we have a, a crisis of um, the number of units available in our city and what you're putting forth is a, is a good way, a way, maybe not the best way. There's flaws to every way of providing additional housing units and this is a good way to increase the volume. And I believe that the 500 feet came from, um, that's how big a traditional block is and so if you want to be a block away, if you want to develop on the far end of that block, you need to have a 500 feet. So it's a little bit of insight that I have gleaned. Um, I live in a blue bubble, I live in a duplex, and I enjoy where I live. Um, and I think we need to increase our housing stock and reducing the barrier for developers is the way to increase that housing stock because the city can't build a lot of houses. They're not in the business of doing that. They're help in the business of facilitating that and creating equity within the city. Um, and so reducing the the amount for the special use is a way. This is another way. I think you guys can weigh that back and forth. But I think they both have provide good insight. So that is my two cents. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. All right. Others wish to be heard? Chris, my name is Chris Jurians, and I live over on the west side of Grand Rapids, and my property is in the blue bubble. 
Grand Rapids is not Chicago, Detroit, Seattle, or Portland. Grand Rapids has its own entities, its own neighborhoods. It's what makes Heritage Hill different from East Town, different from downtown, and different from one side of our town to the other. Affordable housing in Grand Rapids is an oxymoron. All the new developments being planned and those already built will cost upwards of $3,000 a month for rent without any of the utilities or other costs associated with apartment living. According to statistics from Data USA, 26% of the population in Grand Rapids lives below the poverty line, a number that is higher than the national average of 14.7%. The criteria used for affordable housing is 80% of the AMI, which is 40,000, and 80% is 32,400. The most common racial or ethnic group living below the poverty line in Grand Rapids is white, followed by black and Hispanics. The areas being targeted by the developers of quote unquote affordable housing just happen to include the neighborhoods that most of these people live in. Another group losing out in this case are disabled, elderly, and young families just starting out to be homeowners. Utilizing the buy right option, the neighborhood loses its collective voice as to what kind of development goes into their neighborhood. If one person sells, it has a domino effect as more and more people sell their homes until you have blocks of empty houses that will be snatched up by developers and torn down. Other concerns center around the styles of architecture that are going to be built or have already been built. The gateway at Belknap Apartments look exactly like the apartments on Lake Michigan Drive by the Y, Michigan and Diamond units, and the Leonard and Alpine unit that's going to be going up. By taking away the right of the people to voice their concerns and ask questions, you are dooming many neighborhoods to pack and stack communities in keeping with Agenda 21, which the City of Grand Rapids joined in back in the 1990s. And there are made up rules including forced use of mass transit and of course the miles of new bike lanes that hardly anybody is seen using. Rockford Construction and many other developers both in the city and out stand to make big bucks from all the new buildings going up. To the 26% of the people living in Grand Rapids below the poverty level and those living from paycheck to paycheck, it's even more unaffordable and more importantly, practically unobtainable. There is a lot of development going up along Bridge Street, but most of it is bars. We're already known as Beer City. Who wants to be known as more Beer City? Parking is hard to find, and many of these new developments are not going to offer parking. So gentrification is a double-edged sword. On one hand, it makes a very diversified mix of people, but on the other hand, it also displaces many people who cannot afford the so-called, quote, affordable, unquote, housing. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate that. Hi, welcome. Hi, um, I'm Chai Benedict. I'm, I, I work at West Grand Neighborhood Organization, but I'm also a resident of the West Grand Neighborhood. Um, I am here to deliver a booklet of survey results. Um, and I'm only gonna read the top results for each recommendation because if I went through it all, I'd run out of time. And you, and you have those to leave with us? I'm leaving this book with you because it's 79 pages. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Um, we had uh, 210 surveys taken uh, from residents all over the city, some of which are in that blue bubble, some of it which are not in the blue bubble. Um, out of recommendation number three, we had 153 residents that strongly disagree with the recommendation. Uh, for recommendation number six, we had 99 out of 210 residents that strongly disagree with the re recommendation. Uh, recommendation number eight, we had 120 residents that strongly disagree with the recommendation. Recommendation nine, we had 145 residents that strongly disagree with the recommendation. And that's out of 210, we did get a 211th, a little late in the game, that's why it's not in those numbers, but it is in the uh, booklet by zip code. So you can actually look at the zip codes that each of the surveys were submitted under. And there is mapping in here and graphs in here. Um, I can tell you that 192 of the survey takers are residents. Two of them are business owners. One was a developer uh, not of the city of Grand Rapids. Uh, there were 12 uh, survey takers that were resident and business owners. 
and there were four that answered as unknown because they didn't leave their leave there whether they were resident or not so um, there is also a map showing where the survey ba uh, takers are in the neighborhood um, if they gave their address so I'm hoping you'll look through all these and see the comments the comments are here and you will be able to read it all that's all the time I have great thank you appreciate that Hi, welcome. Hi, I'm Dwayne DeRue. I'm in the 600 block of Crescent. I am one block in from Alcohol Alley along Michigan Street. Um, my house is in the blue zone and smack dab in the middle of it now that it, if, if it exceeds out to 500 feet. Uh, what that's going to guarantee is that somebody can alter a structure or infill with something that doesn't look anywhere as close to my house, which is a more Victorian style home. I've spent 27 years working on my home. It started out marginal, and now it actually looks like something. Other neighbors have also taken good care of their properties, and it's neighborhood. But that's now at risk because of this crazy decision. I was present at the planning commission meeting when it came about, completely out of thin air from the 100 to the 500. And, um, you know, no design and design standards were barely discussed, but the 500 feet was discussed a lot. Um, you know, so they, they said, well, design standards can't be addressed because that's how do we do a one size fits all. But then they do this 500 foot as a one size fits all when all of these neighborhood pockets are extremely different, have their own character. How do you apply that across the board either? Um, that was just beyond reckless to me. Um, so we've already been there, done that with the um, you know, property that got approved by planning with zero input from the neighbors, 616, huge, ugly. It's, you know, it, how do you work around that now? Um, it put a lot of extra traffic into the neighborhood. At the time when all of those things were being discussed, the chairman, the planning chair of the time, bragged that they could waive 100% of the parking if they wanted to. And since then, they did three different times since then. Same planning chairman um, said, well, the, the, the solutions will come, it's a pregnant moment, the solution will come of itself. I'm kind of hoping he's had his own pregnant moment for what he's put us through. But um, it was a, it, that's the rudeness that we've experienced in for you know, uh, going down there to talk against all that stuff. But it's, it's just unbelievable, it's reckless, it's reactionary, and it just puts a lot of chaos off into the neighborhood. We're kind of over the Steve Urkel approach of causing chaos and sitting back, did we do that? It, it, it needs to be thoughtful, respectful of the neighborhood, and they're, to me, they're like the teenagers who are running the household. You have the privilege that you were voted in to represent us, I think it's time for you as a group of, of commissioners to be the adults in the room and pull the planning commission back in check where they need to be before our neighborhoods are completely overrun by ugly buildings that don't fit and affect and actually will detract my home value rather than enhance it. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Duane. Hi. Hello, Commissioners. Don Lee from the Easttown Community Association and the Neighborhood Association Collaborative. The recommendations developed by the Housing Advisory Committee are recommendations only. Uh, they now need to be examined by the community in a planned and intentional process moderated by the city. The community, sta the community stakeholders the City Commission should prim primarily be concerned with our residents who at this point have been ex excluded from the process. The process needs to include thoughtful community input, and a single public hearing is not going to accomplish that. The recommendations for zoning changes need to be shared and understood by property owners and the residents of the city as we are the long-term stakeholders in this matter. Well, there's limited data supporting that supply side economics reference in support of increasing housing stock will increase affordable housing. We do have decades of data that demonstrates that the commodification of single-family homes favors wealthy, decreases home ownership opportunities, and, con and contributes to wealth disparity. 
It's, it's claimed that the development process ar is arduous and the city is under-resourced. The solution lies in increasing revenue from developers who have the privilege of developing property in our city, not opening our zoning code to unmitigated development. We should support developers who are willing to align their projects with the long-term vision of the citizens of Grand Rapids. We also need to reduce tax incentives and scale development fees according to project size in order to provide relief to those seeking to develop smaller projects and secure revenue to expand planning and economic, economic development staff. <clears throat> If we want to improve affordability, we need intentional housing set-asides. We need to invest in measures that increase wages. We need to prioritize keeping marginalized families in their homes. And we need to create opportunities for residents who are struggling financially to increase their personal wealth while helping to address affordability in our community. The Rose Center assessment reported that Grand Rapids will not build its way into affordability. The City Commission has the power of, and the backing of the residents to accomplish this. We need to abandon blind faith in the market to solve issues the market itself has created and take an intentional and multifaceted approach to understand and address these problems. The, the 2018 Homes for All report, Communities Over Commodities, has laid out five guiding principles that must be ingrained in the process of getting to affordable housing solutions. These include community control, affordability, permanence, inclusivity, and health and sustainability. Residents and neighborhood associations can be allies, not only in, in supporting initiatives aimed at affordability, but in facilitating dialogue and championing incremental change where there are opportunities that are openly vetted and intentionally implemented. Productive conversations have begun, and they should continue in earnest. However, these recommendations need serious examination and development that can only be accomplished through substantive community engagement. We ask that the City Commission support this process, and we are offering the historic and collective knowledge of engaged, re engaged residents to assist in reaching a favorable outcome. And thank you all for your work on this. Thank you, Don. Appreciate it. That was fa You were speedy in your reading. That's impressive. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, my name Hi. is Chris Hammond. I'm a resident of Grand Rapids. Uh, one of my greatest concerns is the spirit of the language in this zoning. Uh, it's not in keeping with past spirits of the city. The master plan that was created in 2000 allowed for zoning overlays for neighborhoods could be more restrictive if they could collaborate together. Neighborhoods have done that. They raised $80,000 for that process to create those overlays. Through community input, findings from some of those overlays yielded desires to grow certain assets like the Fulton Street Farmers Market, which then resulted in a capital campaign that raised nearly $3 million over a two-year process of development. That level of engagement speaks to quality of life. That's the reason we're having this discussion to begin with, because people want to be here. We cannot lose face, cannot lose sight of what it is that drove all of this. That is, people want to be here. I'm not from Grand Rapids. This is my home. This will always be my home. I, I appreciate the efforts. I, I understand why they're being done. Uh, but we're more than three years into this development phase. This growth cycle is already well matured. It's nearing the end already. We're not going to get ahead of it. And we're not going to get ahead of the next one either. Developers are designed by purpose to be adaptive to the market forces. Governments are not. A developer's goal, their, their motivation, is to maximize capital growth during these market trends. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that either. It is not the goals of local government to maximize development, to maximize income. It is to protect the community and to protect their assets well beyond this current trend, this current growth spurt, because it won't be sustained and it won't be there forever, and then we'll have to relive with whatever's left. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because of these differences in purpose, it, it really would be much more constructive if we had a policy that protects the city, that doesn't remove engagement, that doesn't remove the pausing of, of development so that we still have input, so we still have some level of control over what's left behind after development has moved on and we're left with the remnants. Development can be good. Development can help the neighborhoods change for the needs, but they should be incremental changes. They should not be two-step functions. Growth is a one step at a time. If you take two steps, you destroy what it is that a community is, the fabric, the connectivity, the desire to want to be there. Without desire, people will choose something that fits them, and it won't be what's changed once you've made the change and not included them. I appreciate your efforts. I know this is very difficult, but you don't get into public office without the idea to grow thick skin. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, 
All right. Good evening, Mayor Bliss and City Commissioners. My name is Sharon LaChapelle. I live in the Godwin Heights neighborhood of Wyoming and work at Baxter Community Center in Grand Rapids and uh, worship and have friends that live in the city and are reeling from the housing crisis. Um, tonight I'd like to, um, well, myself and Grand Rapids Homes for All would like to thank you for focusing your attention on the affordable housing crisis and for hosting this public hearing to listen to the hopes and concerns of Grand Rapids residents. At this moment, I'd like to take a second to recognize the other members that are in line with me, and we're just going to take turns speaking. But perhaps there are some Grand Rapids Homes um, for all people in the audience that aren't going to speak tonight, if they could just raise their hand, or anybody that's partnered with us or supports the things that Grand Rapids Homes for All is working towards. I also have a document here that kind of summarizes everything that we're going to say. Would you like me to submit that now or? Yeah, now or afterwards is fine. Might as well just go ahead. Yep. Thank you. <clears throat> After two years of pushing for resident voice and development decisions and policies that led to quality, that lead to quality affordable housing, Grand Rapids Homes for All is grateful for the policies that have already passed such as the Voluntary Equitable Development Agreement. Our vision is that quality, affordable housing will be equitably accessible to all Grand Rapids residents. Stable, stable housing affects a person's health, job opportunities, education, ability to enhance the community and sense and feeling of belonging within a community. Too many people in our city struggle to find quality um, housing and affordable homes. Rising rents, unjust evictions, and homelessness will only be solved when people are put before profit and when housing is considered a human right and not a commodity. And now I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Gordy. Oh, and sign. That's what I want to do. <laughs> yes, thank you for remembering to do that. It makes our, our clerk's job easier, so thank you. My name is Mr. Gordy. Hi. Hi. I live at uh, 568 Morris. That's right by Pleasant Park. We've lived there for 44 years. Uh, so uh, have experienced a lot of different changes. Um, one of the things is uh, being there for that long, I've come to realize that with development in neighborhoods, the threat of the real <laughs> reality of displacement is real. It happens. It's happened to my neighbors. That is why we believe that decisions about land and housing require the input of community residents, both homeowners and renters. We're disappointed in a way that three of the four policies in the public hearing fail to uh, enable the neighbor's ability to shape development through public input. They're by right. A few months ago when the Housing Now recommendation came out, we engaged residents and then sent a letter to the city signed by more than 100 people from all three wards. In the letter, we identified the proposals we support with specified requested changes. At that point, recommendation six, the density bonus is one of the proposals we support and continue to. We did not talk about recommendations three, eight, and nine. Today, tonight, we want to speak to those. And by the way, from our perspective, 30% of a person's income is affordable housing. 60 to 300% of AMI doesn't quite get us there. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Jim and Jolanda Howe. We live at 126 Burr Oak Street in the Creston neighborhood. Um, First, we would like to ask you to pass recommendation number six, the density bonus. This is a policy that will increase the amount of affordable housing in our city. The density bonus for affordable housing would act as an exception to the zoning rules, allowing a, uh, a project to include more units than is currently allowed within the space and height of a building by agreeing to make 30% of the units affordable according to the federal and state standards of affordable housing, which is 30% of a household's income that is at or below 60% area median income. 
We are grateful to the Planning Commission for adding the failure to perform clause to this um, particular re recommendation. Developers should be held accountable to their commitments for providing affordable housing. And we ask that you extend the requirement for keeping the affordable units affordable as long as is legally possible so that each person who lives there can count on stable housing for years to come. There are many market rate housing developments going in our city right now that require hourly full-time wages of $23 or more to afford. That is more than double what people working at minimum wage in our city are making. We hope in the future developers will use this bonus to create mixed income units that include affordable housing instead. Thank you. Saved you three minutes there Jim? tonight. You, guys you, you get another three minutes. Oh, I'm good. That's it? You're not adding? She pulled me in with her. She said, we're All going right. once. They don't need to hear from you as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Howe. <laughs> Appreciate your input and all your advocacy. <laughs> all right. Others who wish to be heard? Hi. Um, I'll sign that in a minute. Um, my name is Joyce Daniels, as you guys have heard my name a lot um, within this last year. Um, for the past 50 some odd years, I've lived in the Baxter neighborhood. Um, if recommendation 3, 8, and 9 are passed, um, the Baxter neighborhood will quickly become the Baxter development of housing. We don't want that. We want to keep our neighborhood. Um, when a family acquires a home, it's a major, it's a major purchase. It's an investment. It's for the security. Um, uh, uh, it's for the security of where they live and, and, their, and what they want for the future. Um, one of the major considerations is the neighborhood that they choose to, put the, to buy the house in. They want to keep the neighborhood looking like a neighborhood and not looking like a main street. We don't want that. Currently, I live in the blue area, according to the file. That's not acceptable to me. My rights should outweigh buy rights for the investor. They don't either live, they either don't live in the, the city. I know they don't live in my neighborhood. And a lot of times they don't even live in the state. We say don't give them the don't give them take my rights to give it to them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Good evening. My name is Frank Lynn and I live at 3446 Devon Northeast and I'm with Homes for All. And I want to thank all of you commissioners for the hard work you put into trying to create affordable housing in our city. It's certainly a crisis. And this is a great evening. I've been involved in neighborhood organizing for a long time, and I haven't seen this room this full in years, absolutely years. So you've cr created something great. You've brought the people out. But what I'm hearing is that the people don't want to go forward with uh, proposals 3, 8, and 9 as they're presented. And that's the position of Homes for All. Um, this is all about citizen input. And what these proposals do is take the citizens' right to speak away by giving uh, the possibility for development by right to huge areas of the city, that cuts out citizens' in citizen input. Um, what we really need to do is look at these proposals through the master planning process. We need to start a master planning process as soon as possible, uh, get as many people as possible involved, and nobody knows how to do that better than our planning, uh, head of the planning department, Suzanne Schultz, and really do some true community engagement. Too often today, it's the developers who are running the show. It's time we give the power back to the people. To, one of the things we should be looking at is the community, uh, the community engagement proposals put forward by the Urban Core Collective. It's pretty important that we involve all marginalized parts of the community. Um, unfortunately, that's not what's currently happening. Let's look at what we can do. Let's um, uh, involve as many people as possible. My neighborhood's right up the hill here in Belknap. 
And if you want to know what buy right gets you, look at what they've done to Belknap. It's buy right that they've torn down all that affordable housing and put in unaffordable apartments. Too many people are being displaced. Let's stop this process now, open it up to the public, and get a plan that people want. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. Oh, ma'am, please no clapping. Although I, I, Frank is very passionate and I really adore him and respect him, but I want to make sure that other people who feel differently feel comfortable sharing their opinion. So, Hello, my name is Martha Cooper. I live in the northeast side of uh, Grand Rapids. Um, I've lived in many other sides of town I can no longer afford to live in. So I'm involved with Homes for All, and I come with the group tonight to speak to the proposals. Um, we want affordable housing providers in our city, like Link, ICCF, and Dwelling Place, to be able to build affordable housing. We know that recent federal tax cuts, cuts will reduce the 2019 HUD budget that fuels so many of the affordable housing projects we need in order to preserve affordable housing in our city. What we object to in recommendations 3, 8, and 9 are not the housing types, but the buy right part of the proposals and the expanded designation areas. We would like to see all of these more affordable housing uh, types available in our zoning code so that through a process of public input, affordable housing providers could build non-condo zero lot line duplexes, townhomes, and row houses. Small scale development projects would certainly fit better and be less likely to push out current residents than the kind of large scale developments that we see going on in our city. Accessory dwelling units don't pose a threat to neighboring, neighborhood stability, but they should involve a conversation with the neighbors because community matters. I'd like to say too, I've heard uh, people speak about the stakeholders in the city. And we heard that, I've heard all kinds of figures. 25% of our housing, uh, single family homes are owned by outside developers. And that means that they rise, we're not having families living in those houses with a stake in them. Also, we had colleges coming into this town and even expanding here. They did not bring any housing with them. And that pressurized people that were in the community already. I believe that our city is our city, that you work for us. I believe that low income, uh, uh, elderly people still have a place and should have a voice in this city, even if they aren't high dollar taxpayers. I believe that we should start breaking down barriers between classes and colors instead of creating more of them. I saw the maps. Once you add color to them, it is very clear that most of the buy right that you're talking about is going to be happening in low income areas with a predominant people of color. And I object to that. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. All right, others who wish to be heard? Good evening. Hi. My name is Dane Gates. I live in the third ward in the Baxter neighborhood. Without public input, we fear what could happen. What would stop big developers with deep pockets from buying up whole blocks of neighborhoods and demolishing the homes of renters in order to build expensive brownstones that cause rents to rise in the rest of the neighborhood? Who would hold developers accountable to listening to the community and preventing displacement? No, these proposals are premature. They belong in the master plan not in a giveaway to developers under the guise of solving housing problems. We ask that you allow residents to determine how much or how little of these housing types should be included, but always, always with public input. Though your planning team is already stretched, then we ask you to seize this moment when neighborhoods are debating about zoning when homeowners are hearing about the need for more affordable housing in their neighborhoods. 
When housing is a front and center issue, let the momentum of these conversations carry the master plan forward faster, maximizing public input. Because we can't wait any longer for affordable housing, but we have to solve this problem the right way, or we are going to be in a worse situation than we are facing now. Thank you. Thank you, Dane. Hi, welcome. Thank you. My name is Taylor Musil, and I am a Southeast Side resident on the corner of Hall and Fuller. Um, and we believe that recommendations 3, 8, and 9 that are being commented on tonight um, are some of the weakest and most problematic recommendations in the whole Housing Now package. Um, and because of that, we hope that we can move from those to, um, and, so, and then we hope that you will vote down these recommendations um, in support of our rights over by right and move to two recommendations in the Housing Now package um, that we found after engaging um, residents that um, will actually move the needle on the crisis. And so we think that those two remaining recommendations, which are the affordable housing fund and the rental application fee ordinance, um, are things that deserve a robust public hearing and a yes vote. And so the rental application fee ordinance um, will limit application fees, disclose the system that landlords use to screen applicants, and return those fees when applicants aren't offered the apartment. Um, and we know that that even people who are um, lucky enough to receive a resource that will cover the cost of, of their housing, um, a lot of times those programs don't cover the cost of rental application fees. So this is a barrier that's keeping people from getting into housing they could otherwise afford. Um, and so the Affordable Housing Fund is something that will establish a source of funding that can create, be creatively used to keep people in affordable housing um, from losing that housing and to build new affordable housing. Um, and so we believe that at least eight of the 15 um, voting members on this oversight board um, should be city residents who have experience with the housing crisis in their adult life, because then that will result in creative and equitable spending of that money. Um, and so we think growing this fund and building a strong oversight board are two critical ways the city can begin gaining ground on housing. So we urge you to put those two recommendations up for public hearing um, in April and to pass them with with strong public education and accountability measures in place um, so that they will succeed and start to break down the huge barriers that people face when they're trying to have affordable housing. And I also urge every person in this room that if you haven't already, read those two proposals and come back when we have that public hearing and stand in favor of an affordable housing community fund and a rental application ordinance um, next month. Um, we thank you for your consideration on behalf of Grand Rapids Homes for All. Thank you. Hi. Good evening, Mayor, members of the Commission. Um, my name is Ryan Verwise. I'm a Garfield Park resident, and also I serve with Inner City Christian Federation, an affordable housing organization here in town. Uh, while I don't have the same ability to have exuberance like Frank, I share his excitement that this has become uh, an issue that we're talking about as a community, and I appreciate the fact that you have made this something that you're paying attention to as a commission. And I thank you for taking the efforts with, through the Housing Now uh, process to begin to explore how we can address this crisis that we're in today, a shortage of affordable housing. As you've heard tonight, uh, we are at a, a place of crisis, and I think everyone in our community, for the most part, is saying we want to make sure that this community can be a place where people of all walks of life can find safe, affordable housing. And we believe that the recommendations before you tonight are a good start in many ways. It's a start of a conversation, and we believe that they have great potential to potentially add various types of housing that would be more affordable by, by virtue of the size and varied type. That said, we also have been in the process and, and we've been trying to listen. I think listening is an important thing as we um, engage in community dialogue and we've been engaging with several of the neighborhood associations. And, and as we've listened, we've heard that uh, some of the challenge with the Housing Now recommendations that are before you is the process, that the process has been uh, too fast. And so we would recommend, um, and we've witnessed that the speed of the process has caused a bit of, I think, confusion and misunderstanding about the proposals before us, or before you. And so um, ICSF would recommend that based on these conversations that we've had and as we've listened, uh, but also based on the understanding that we are in a, an immediate crisis, we would recommend that the commission delay voting on these proposed changes by 90 days. 
to give the city staff additional time to convene public meetings uh, for continued uh, education and dialogue, uh, to answer questions and gather feedback from neighborhoods. And we believe that this could address some of the neighborhood concerns about the process being too uh, rapid, but also keeps in mind the important good work that the staff has already done and the recommendations, that uh, the work that went into the recommendations. We believe that taking additional three months to fine tune the recommendations would actually help to engage neighborhood associations, help foster positive outlook toward these recommendations, and likely su uh, support the eventual implementation of these policies. We do not advocate, though, that we wait longer than 90 days. We are at a point of crisis. The status quo continues to put our neighbors who are on the margins at risk of displacement. And so we would advocate for that 90-day extension, but no longer. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention to this matter. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. All right, others wish to be heard? Hi. Hi. My name is Megan Cruz. I'm a Creston resident, I'm, and I'm the director of the Creston Neighborhood Association. Um, the, as they are written currently, um, recommendations number three, eight, and nine set up a false choice between affordable housing and community engagement. Um, you received a, a letter from our board of directors by email, um, and I'd like to give a little more context to that letter now. Um, the Creston Neighborhood Association receives a CDBG grant to, um, to cultivate civic engagement. And I'd like to share a little bit of what, what we've learned from our neighbors through a survey on housing. Overwhelmingly, Creston residents desire affordable housing in Creston. They also want intentional mixed income housing, a place for all neighbors to thrive. Overwhelmingly, Creston neighbors want people who live in Creston to be able to make a home in Creston. They do not want displacement of their neighbors. Overwhelmingly, Creston neighbors want home ownership to be encouraged and they want home ownership to be affordable. Creston neighbors want the city to address the need for affordable housing. The planning department's data compendium <coughs> identifies Creston as one of the last affordable housing neighborhoods in the city. Um, and so you can understand why we wanna take this very seriously. Um, please do not pass the recommendations, especially number three and nine as they're written now. Please establish a del deliberate work group of residents and developers to employ their wisdom, community wisdom, and our shared value for the common good to solve the problem together. Thank you. Uh, Peter Carlberg, I live in the John Ball uh, area, neighbors area by John Ball Park. You've got a a uh, letter opposing many of these uh, resolutions by uh, our neighborhood already. Uh, I spent eight years on your planning commission and I worked entirely during the whole time of the master plan revising process. Uh, I'm trying to cut to the chase on these things because the two things that really tick people off about this are one, the part that these things target single family homes is somehow the, uh, the enemy of affordable housing. And so we need to make it easy to tear them down and replace them with multifamily housing. Any mechanism in this that does this is going in the wrong direction for our neighborhoods. And the second thing is that map with all the blue bubbles. Now, that mechanism of saying if you live in this proximity to a business area, that means you're less desirable and your single family houses can come down. We can make it easier for landlords or developers or whoever to turn those into multifamily units is going in the wrong direction again. It targets the neighborhoods that have been most challenged by the trends in the last several decades, but especially in recent years with the housing uh, bubble bursting and a lot of homes uh, going into foreclosure and then being bought up by landlords, we have lost a large percentage of our homeowners in our neighborhoods. We need to recover those homeowners and we need those homes for homeowners, not turned into apartment buildings. We already have more than our share of rental percentage in our neighborhoods. We need to keep a hold of our opportunities for homeowners in the neighborhoods that are challenged in these maps with the blue bubbles. You want to come up with some other thing that has a different mechanism and goes after areas that there's maybe a decent argument for, that's open to discussion. But the one that's put up, which is by proximity to business areas, is 
dead wrong. It smacks of stuff they did 80 years ago. That was a bad idea then, and it's a bad idea now. Thank you, Peter. Hello, I'm Jeremy DeRue, um, resident of the Third Ward and executive director of Link Up. Um, as an organization that is committed to both community uh, raising community voice and developing affordable housing, I find it a difficult place to sit here tonight, and I have great sympathy for the choices that lay ahead of you right now. Um, throughout the last few years, we've had conversations about affordable housing. I've, it's been clear that kind of inclusionary zoning is not an option in the state of Michigan for legal reasons. Um, unfortunately, exclusionary zoning still remains alive and well within our state and within our city. Exclusionary zoning is designed as practices such as minimum lot size, minimum unit size, and developing kind of single family detached exclusive neighborhoods that are inherently less affordable and have the impact of creating economically exclusive and isolated communities that are not diverse and, and that this practice has been put into place in zoning, zoning throughout the country it is a pretty well recognized method in which um, in which the discrimination has been perpetuated across the country for, in many different ways. The Department of Justice have issued a report with HUD identifying these practices and calling an, an end to such things. And so to the extent that these recommendations, fundamentally all three that, that people have objection to, ha have been about removing minimum lot size, removing um, minimum unit size, and um, allowing for alternative types of housing to be developed in communities, it is hard not to see that as removing structural racism as it exists within the city of Grand Rapids right now, and it is hard not to recommend that. At the same time, we live in a community that does not have enough opportunity for community engagement in real estate development projects. And as a result of that lack of capacity for listening to community, by removing structural racism from our, design, from our own ordinances, we're removing the community voice that is the only source by which we can actually effectively and intelligently navigate the deconstruction of an 80-year history of discrimination within our city. And we need to find ways to embrace the community voice, the community perspective, in dismantling these structures while simultaneously removing these barriers to affordable housing and integrated communities that exist here in Grand Rapids. The choice that somebody before me said, you have a false choice. Right now, the options that are presented give you the choice between removing discrimination and listening to community. That is a very difficult choice between two. And if, those are the, if your only options going forward is an up-down vote, you have a very difficult decision to make. <laughs> I, as a resident who cares deeply about this community, the needs that it is facing, could not sit here and say, say, do not support the removal of discrimination from practices. I cannot in good faith recommend that you do that. At the same time, as a, as a person who has seen, who has been involved in development projects, who has seen the wisdom of community make developments, make ordinances, make the city a better place, I also cannot say that we will find solutions if we don't find ways to engage the broader community in solving these problems. You have an opportunity, I think, a short window to see if there's a way to save these recommendations, remove that false choice. I think the primary concern people have is about the potential for demolition and the removal of their voice from the project. I think there are ways to resolve that problem through subtle changes to this without removing the ability of it to be non-discriminatory while actually enhancing the ability of the community's voice to guide us through this process of redesigning our neighborhoods to be more inclusive. Thank I you. hope we take that opportunity to do that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Jeremy. Hello, Hi. my name is Welcome. Ahmed Ali, I'm from the Third War. I just wanted to discuss about the, um, the housing development that's go that's, that you guys are looking at right now. I was gonna say that for individuals who grew up here in the city, I believe that we should stay in the city and continue to grow in the city instead of bringing outsiders and building up our city, pushing us out, way out Kentwood area, I think we should just find a way or come up with a plan or something where we could still stay within our city, continue to grow, grow within Grand Rapids. Thank you. All right, others wish to be heard? Hi, my name is John Evans. I live in Highland Park area. Um, one gentleman originally said about fear as a motivator, and three, eight, and nine scare me. I can see these as potential destruction of traditional housing. I acknowledge that there is a need for affordable housing, but I can see this as a, a way of developers coming in, scooping up large areas of homes, destroying neighbor, uh, traditional neighborhoods, and then renting out um, closets and calling them 
affordable housing for people. I don't know how many people really want to live in a closet and no trees and just that's their, their home, that's their whole world. I'd like to have some uh, input from the people of the neighborhoods because this is their home. They, a lot of people have lived there all their lives. I know I lived in mine. I'm the fourth generation on my lot. And this takes away a lot of the say that people in the neighborhoods have this by right. We need to have people involved in this, not only for their input, but buying into it, making their own commitment to make this work. And if you take this away from the people and give it to the government or developer, it's just going to be them following orders. And I don't really know of any too many people that want that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, evening, Mayor and Commissioners. I had two minutes and 50 seconds prepared, but I don't need to say all that. Um, I, I, my name is Todd Babick. I'm an uh, East Town resident and small business owner. Uh, and I want to thank Suzanne for that awesome document. I studied it um, and I learned a lot and it certainly highlights the massive complexity of these issues. Um, and unlike a lot of other people, uh, though I'm not convinced that we're in a particularly new or urgent crisis here, what I learned from that document is that affordable housing is a very old problem in need of a very thoughtful and comprehensive solution. So I'd like to advocate to um, put it off for the master planning process, uh, which is also a very inclusive um, uh, way to arrive at solutions. Um, uh, I also appreciate what Suzanne brought up. I, I don't see a need in this city, this city, um, for buy right development because it sounds like the existing approval process works pretty well and is, is not a tremendous barrier to uh, development. As she said, two-thirds of multifamily dwellings are already approved administratively, and there doesn't seem to be an indication that the remaining third are, are heavily burdened by the process. Um, and then the, the third point is that um, along those lines, uh, there was some discussion earlier about um, how to make it easier to, to pass through that process. And I think that design guidelines could be a part of uh, establishing um, or helping builders and others uh, wanting to develop to understand what is expected. And um, uh, I was quite disturbed that the um, Housing com uh, Planning Commission uh, didn't want to be bothered with those design guidelines and decided to remove them. So I would advocate for putting those back in. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Ted. Hello, my name is Bill Breiker. Um, I'm kind of an oddball like the other person tonight. I live in Hudsonville, but my wife and I have owned uh, Heritage Hill multi-units for 30 plus years. Our motive is uh, saying is we will make your, our house your home. Um, what I want to speak to is if, let's look into the future if you let this happen. My daughter and son-in-law lived in Seattle for two years. Their first apartment building was approximately 20 or 30 units, where you could see it was right smack in the neighborhood, in the center of a block, uh, micro units for about $800, $900 a month. And then they moved into another apartment that was $1,800 for a 500 uh, square foot one bedroom. Traffic was horrible. You park your car, you leave it, because you're probably not going to get your spot back on the street again. So you two lanes of traffic, but only one lane, one car could go through. If you want the city of Grand Rapids to look like the city of Seattle, and you're going to let the developers have control of the neighborhoods, that's what it's going to look like. Second thing, um, I'm amazed at the growth that the city has seen. And I read the papers, my, um, you know, another, tonight, another project's going in on Bridge Street. I don't know how in the world the rents cover the cost of the building. I really don't. These buildings are expensive, and the rents are really, I don't know how they do it. Um, my concern is this, is that at some point in the future, they gotta recover those costs. And the only way to do it is to increase rents more. So be prepared. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, for your input. 
Hi, I'm Ron Jimerson, Executive Director of Seeds of Promise. And I'm basically speaking for the residents, and I'm going to make this short. One of the things that they're asking the commissioners is that you need to look at your own data. You put out a publication that says significant growth in the Latino population, but that also shows an exit of African Americans in the 49507 area, huge exit. And what their feelings are is that by passing this, it's going to accelerate this process. They're moving into Kentwood and everywhere else, but they're no longer there. Then when you, your other data basically shows that where you basically segregated us back in the 50s, now the rent's the highest in those areas. So, you know, they're really asking that we get some input from the residents and maybe this be a, a broader planning process. And I can leave these copies for you, okay? Thank you. But please, consider that because gentrification is real and it's shown in your own data. Thank you, Ron. Appreciate it. And good to see you. I'm Bar Miriam Barrera Young, and I'm the executive director of Baxter Neighborhood Association. I lived in the neighborhood for 30 years and moved out of the neighborhood because of some illness in my family, but uh, I work in that neighborhood for over 29 years and also in the MLK area. What I see too is a lot of gentrification in my neighborhood that I work in in Baxter and South Five, um, and it's because we clean up one area with a crime and it opens the door for investment. And as we make our area stronger, we have to hear the voices of our residents also. In master planning, um, the city was really invested in getting the voices of the neighbors, getting the people involved in that process. We even had you paid neighborhood associations to pull, pull meetings together. It's hard to do this by explaining one-on-one -on -one with residents. I mean, it's, it's, very, it's really impossible because when you talk about it, they want to see it. Then you have to meet with them and, and go over, over a paper, and that shouldn't, it shouldn't be like that. The process should be where we're meeting somewhere where, where we have a map and we can actually see what's happening to our neighborhoods. And I, you know, the buy right thing would really tear down Baxter's neighborhood, especially in the, in the South Town Sid area, because we have residential homes in the business district, on, on, even on the fuller end of it, where we share that with, with East Town. So my whole thing is we need to take time and digest this. And from what I hear today that, you know, everybody's not on the same page, even with your committee and, you know, the housing committee. So it's, we need to, to step back from the table and take a good look at what we're doing, uh, you know, for the people, by the people. We need to include the people. We need to be inclusive and transparent in this process. And I want to I want to commend all of you for your work. I want to commend Suzanne Schultz and her team for all the things that they've done. I want to even some of the developers that met with NAC, the commissioners that came out to meet, and Don that that kind of headed spearheaded that initiative, Housing Now. All the people that are here tonight, they're here for a reason. It's late tonight. They've had a long day, just like you have. But their concerns, it's not fear. They want their voices heard. They want their voices heard and they want to be part of this process. And I know that you will take that in consideration and please don't vote on this now. I mean, give us time to get the neighbors together, the input from the community to see what people really want to see. And the older people that can't come out here tonight, they're not computer savvy, they need to be heard also and, and the disabled people. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm Marty, Marthea Daling Jager, and I want to thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. I have lived in the Garfield Park Neighborhood Association area for 33 years. I urge you to reject all of the presented proposals. The City Housing Advisory Committee from which the proposals came is a flawed, unjust managerial system 
with bias towards developers. Its own list of participants, as well as my own observations at the meetings, consists of hand-selected voters, elected officials, city staff, and developer company representatives, and not one person from the affected community. The proposals are weak and do not address long-term solutions. Rather, I urge you to wait and address the issues by moving up the master plan for true input from affected city residents and not developers. I urge you to reject all by right clauses for building by developers and rather give we the people community control as is our right in a true democracy. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, welcome. My name is Marjorie Steele. Um, I'm a local independent journalist and also I teach in the collaborative design department at Kendall College, which is relevant. Um, so first, I, I want to address um, uh, those comments that were just made and also the comments that made, were made by Samantha Searle. Um, so, uh, it's, it's pretty clear that the uh, commission who put together these recommendations is a significant problem. Um, the representation on that board is, is uh, not only flawed, but the structure of the board and the structure of the planning commission, I believe, is also fundamentally flawed. These suggestions read like a developer's wish list because that's exactly what it is. Um, and uh, yes, it's absolutely critical that we have input from business uh, members and from developers and investors and those who uh, hold the purse strings and also know how this very complex industry works. I should say that I actually um, was in-house for uh, a while at a local urban real estate development startup that all of you here know, I know. Um, so I'm, I'm familiar with how complex it is. That being said, uh, their voice cannot be the only factor and Frankly, the format of these recommendations, the format of the Planning Commission, uh, read to me uh, like something that is put together by, um, not to put too fine a point on it, um, but a city council that is afraid uh, to try something different, that is afraid to take a new strategy to solve a radically wicked problem, which is exactly what we're facing. So instead of uh, piling on more blame <laughs> and more problems, which you guys have heard an earful of tonight, what I would like to, is, uh, to do is actually to propose a, a solution. Um, so Ryan from ICCF uh, proposed extending voting on this 90 days. I'd like to tack on to that and suggest strongly, ask you to um, include an intensive human-centered design process to gather intensive community input from all of these communities to do the actual research, not just talking to uh, building developers, to contractors, and also to developers, but talking to residents and small business owners in the community themselves. Um, as I mentioned, I work in the collaborative design department of Kendall College, and um, I, don't <laughs> I don't mean to be insulting, but these kids are wicked, wicked smart, and honestly, they could put together something far more amazing in 60 days than this commission has put together over the what since since 2015 um, putting a room full of developers and investors in a room seven times is no way to map out our city's future we have incredible creative and design talent in this community um, and we also have incredible volunteering talent in this community so if you guys are interested in working with Kendall College <laughs> Um, I would love to talk with you. I know that my guest, my boss, uh, Gail DeBryan, would be as well. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, others who wish to be heard? A good afternoon, or good evening, should I say, commissioners. Um, thanks for the input, for letting us all come up and voice our opinions on these recommendations and proposals. <clears throat> Excuse me. But as we can see, uh, our community has pretty much spoken. They're not too happy with what they're seeing and hearing. So it's not a lot of brain uh, surgery work we have to do here, nuclear physics and all that. All we gotta do is sit down, put our heads together, get with all four corners of this, of this county, which is north, south, east, and west, give these individuals and all of us an opportunity to come up with a plan together 
Stop letting these developers come in here and get big bucks and crushing people, Grand Rapids lives and things like that. This, this has got to stop. I mean, we, we're, we're adults here. We know what's right and what's wrong. We know what's happening to our community. We see what's going on on a daily basis. So let's take, a, take time out, take a step back, take some of these recommendations and put all these things on hold for a minute to give everybody a chance to review this and give themselves a chance. Now, I'm standing before you guys right now representing an individual that's 84, one's 97, one's 79, and one's uh, 83. And they can't get up and come out here and do this. And we're up here late. It's almost 10 o'clock. <laughs> we need to take time out to really think about what we're doing here. I mean, this is, like, this is, this is something that just don't make sense. I mean, I grew up here all my, from, from here, OK? Um, but the people of Grand Rapids have uh, pretty much said what they had to say today. I mean, this is like no brain work. It's time to step back. Let's re-look re at this and give everybody an opportunity to get it right and do the best thing for everybody in Grand Rapids and just stop letting these developers come in here and just dog us out. This is crazy. This is uh, not what we want. 500 foot, 80% development, really? What we should really be doing, I got 48 seconds. <laughs> <clears throat> We got a problem in 49503, 5, 7, and 8, and 9. Or well, not 9. Well, maybe. <laughs> but we got a problem with contaminated water. Why don't we work on that? That's something we need to be really focusing on. If they want to come and develop something, develop getting that fixed. <laughs> now, let's just take time out, do what's best for the city of Grand Rapids. We, we, we voted you guys in here to do this. Y'all can handle this. Y'all got this. So please, take time out. Do the right thing for me, everybody else out here, and then the old people I just got through mentioning. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Good evening, Your Honor and Commissioners. My name is Jeff Gillis. I live on College Avenue, uh, just a little south of Fulton. I've lived in Heritage Hill one place or another since 1970. And at that time, it was an undesirable <laughs> neighborhood, neighborhood, and it's come a long way. Uh, and not, uh, maybe Heritage Hill is part of the gentrification problem. We need affordable housing, uh, but the concept of neighborhoods should not be overlooked. Heritage Hill was the first organized neighborhood in the city. At the time, the city's plan was to demolish that whole area up the hill and develop it. Turn it over to developers. It was part of the urban renewal concept. Uh, well, Heritage Hill got organized and made something out of it. Uh, East Town followed on that. Garfield Park, the west side. We've got neighborhoods all over the city. They need to be listened to. The solution to the affordable housing problem, and there is one, is not to give the developers the key to the back door. Uh, I have the misfortune of living across the street from the 50 college monstrosity that's going up. And I, if I had time, I'd come in on the planning commission. But in any event, uh, we met with the developers. And they said, well, this, isn't, this is transitional housing. Young people are going to come in here, and we expect they'll live here for two or three or four years, and then they get married, and then they move out. These people aren't part of the neighborhood. They're people who are passing through these multi-families with inadequate parking, uh, inadequate facilities. They're on their way to someplace else once they get established. That's not what we need in our neighborhoods. We need neighbors. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. All right, others who wish to be heard? Oh, and thank you for putting your name down. Hi. Hi. I'm Kay Courtney. I am a realtor and I am. Hi, Kay. <laughs> we'll restart your time. Um, I am a resident of Heritage Hill Historic District in the city of Grand Rapids. And I love it. I've been there for 35 years. I've been a realtor for 33 years. I don't 
dislike developers. As a matter of fact, one of my nicknames is Queen of the Multis because I've represented so many developers in buying multis, but they are buying multis that were already multis. You know why? Because the city of Grand Rapids refused to let us turn a single family into a multi. People asked me to help them do that 30 three years ago when I started, and I got shot down big time. And, and I agreed with the city officials who were shooting me down. That, I was a greenhorn. That was not what Heritage Hill was supposed to be. Heritage Hill is there to save those beautiful old houses. Now, if somebody wants to be a developer, We've got houses they can buy. Not right now, because we don't have any houses to sell. But um, eventually, we will have, and they can buy them. Also, we have vacant lots all over the city of Grand Rapids. Build a four unit. But don't take one of our beautiful single family homes and turn it into a four unit. You're destroying the historic district. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, Kay. Good evening. My name is Kimmy Spring. I live in Easttown, and I'm the community organizer with the Creston Neighborhood Association. And um, my history with housing in this particular aspect of affordable housing especially goes back a few years. I know everyone in this room remembers the foreclosure crisis. And I was part of a team of people. I was the coordinator for foreclosure response, a team of people from all over the county were looking fast and seriously at the, at the foreclosure crisis at the time. Um, by 2011, we had lost one out of seven homes in Grand Rapids to foreclosure. The most affected neighborhood at that time was the Oakdale neighborhood uh, area, where they lost one out of 2.7 homes. And during that process, many of us kept urging um, all the entities involved to not just look at the foreclosure crisis, which we knew was going to turn the corner when people start, when the economy started coming back and people started getting jobs, because that's why they lost their houses to begin with. They lost their job, couldn't pay the mortgage, lost the house. Um, so we were encouraging people to really look at this holistically and the interplay between homelessness, affordable housing, and the foreclosure crisis. Well, we got through the foreclosure crisis, but we didn't continue on that path, especially with honing in and looking at affordability. And the reason this was so important, and I learned after I was on, on this team for three years, and what I learned after reading study after study, report after report, is that the most critical element to the success of a family is housing stability. If you have housing stability, you have much better health. And as we know, by the infant mortality rate in this town for African American women and their children is astronomical. And part of that is the stress of unstable housing contributing to that. The same goes for education. When children have stable housing, they do much better academically. And you can tie, tie stable housing to a lot of different aspects, but basically it has to do with stable housing equals stable families. And without affordable housing, we can't have stable housing. So I am hoping that we really look at this as an opportunity to come together like we came together during the foreclosure crisis. So I would like to implore everyone Come together right now over homes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kimmy. Beat that. <laughs> Sorry. No can do. <laughs> Welcome. Hi. My name is Maria Zaki Starkey, and I have lived in Grand Rapids for 26 years and have always felt like I have had a voice in this city until the Planning Commission meeting of January 25th, when 49 letters of opposition to the Housing Now recommendations were submitted, three of which were from neighborhood associations, one of which was from the Neighborhood Association Coalition, and they were ignored 
at that meeting, and I was just sickened and saddened by that occurrence. And I don't think that that's the city that I love. I don't, I don't think that that's the city that any of us want to see in the future. And I echo many of the sentiments that have been spoken here tonight. <clears throat> oh, I also want to speak to any comments that have been made about neighborhoods that were racist, elitist, NIMBY, we've had our feelings hurt. It's not true. It's just, it's offensive, and I think it's just an attempt to muzzle neighborhoods. And we are all very informed people. We don't need more time to understand the housing initiatives. We need more time to be a part of the process. And I would like to suggest, again, as many others have, that we move this to the planning process, the master planning process. It's where it should have been in the first place. And if we could have had the awesome compendium at the beginning of this process, I think it would have gone much differently. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. And Maria, I said that today, that I wish I would have had that a year ago. So, thank you. And I read it, the whole thing. I did too. It was very informative. Marco Johnson, I live on the west side, the near west side, in the blue bubble. Um, and uh, I'm uh, just going to go over what everyone else has gone over that really concerned about that, the buy right, that the voice of the most vulnerable people of all are going to be taken away uh, through this process. A real concern about the randomness of a 500 foot, um, you know, be border for some of these changes. It doesn't recognize the nuance of each of the different neighborhoods. And some neighborhoods like ours have taken a great effort to put together an ASP that recognizes that some of these housing types are good housing types, in, but in very specific areas that the neighbors understand best. And, and so uh, neighbors being involved in that process is, is really critical at each neighborhood level. And uh, I want to also talk about the fact that there are other opportunities that are prevented because of state regulations. And if we could somehow work on eliminating some of those barriers, I think, uh, um, as they relate to very effective tools uh, as it relates to affordable housing, that that's another area that should be looked at and hasn't been addressed as far as I can see, except at the great housing strategy meetings, one of the particular breakout group I participated in. And ultimately, I think this should wait uh, until the master planning process, and I want to emphasize that. Thank you. Thank you, Margot. All right, anyone else to be, who wants to speak? Go ahead. It's refreshing to not be coming to talk to you about food trucks. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Brennan Summers, and I live in the Garfield Park neighborhood. Um, and when my wife and I moved into that neighborhood about three years ago, we did so because we liked the atmosphere of the neighborhood. We liked the feeling of the neighborhood. We liked the style of the neighborhood. And I'm going to be pretty unpopular here. But when I read through these proposals and I read through the zoning ordinance, I don't feel like that's threatened in my neighborhood by these recommendations. <clears throat> there seems to be a very consistent fear that developers are going to come in and buy up multiple houses in a row and tear them down and build giant apartment complexes. But when I read this, there are limits on how many units the buildings that they build can have. Um, recommendation number three only allows four units per building. That's not going to be in the style of some of the giant apartment complexes that we're seeing going up around the city. Recommendation number nine, which uh, deals with primarily townhouse style dwellings, limits to four or eight attached units per structure. On top of which, if you look at the, the numbers, and I have a calculation here that I'd be willing to share with anybody, but the cost for a developer to buy up four houses in a row, and let's say it's $80,000 a house, to demolish those and redevelop them. If they're getting $2,000 a month for rent on the new development, it's going to take them almost 12 years to return their investment. And I don't know too many developers that are willing to wait that long. On top of which, I heard some comments about fear of developers buying up houses and putting in commercial units. I, I think somebody mentioned a Hardee's. But my understanding of 
these proposals is that it doesn't allow for commercial development on land that's currently zoned residential. Correct me if I'm wrong, commissioners, but my understanding is that if you want to do that, it requires rezoning, which requires a public hearing. That said, there are some changes that I would like to see as well. I think the lack of a requirement for design guidelines um, probably scares a lot of people, and it scares me as well. Um, and I think that that's an easy way to help reassure neighborhoods and to get their input. You know, let's develop those design guidelines with the neighborhood associations. These are the people that know what they want their neighborhoods to be the most. Um, so in, in closing, I think sharing more information and taking more time to listen to all viewpoints, um, I, I think this is a good start and I would support working on it. Thank you. Thank you, Brennan. All right, any final individuals who want to be heard? And then I'm going to close this public hearing because we, we still have one more public hearing after this. <laughs> so, Hi, my name oh, is... Oh, sorry, two. Oh, no, one. Sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. Hi, my name is Eva Malley. I live in the Crested neighborhood on Knapp Street. Um, I hear everyone speaking of houses being turned into multi-units. But there is currently a development, proposed development, across the street from me, directly across. It's a church that they're planning to put 14 apartments in. According to all of the ordinances, currently, they're doing everything correct. They are not, um, they're following all the rules, basically. And even though they're doing everything correct, they're not doing everything right. <laughs> Briggs Park is one block down from me and there are kids all over. Parking is a problem. Um, it is a very busy cut through because I'm right at Plainfield and Knapp. And so the traffic is just really heavy. So to add these multi-unit apartments, these larger ones that are not for, for uh, units or just houses being turned into um, apartment complex. I'm sorry, I'm nervous. No, I didn't plan okay. on speaking. No, that's okay. <laughs> um, it's some of these larger buildings that are being turned into apartment complexes that I'm concerned about. I'm looking into moving because of this, and that's an unfortunate because I love my neighborhood. So that's that's all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Eva. All right. Anyone else who wishes to be heard on the, on the housing? I wasn't going to chat tonight. I'm Dean. I actually uh, live in, uh, on Trowbridge Street in the Belknap area. And I was kind of going to talk real quick. Um, it's an interesting thing because I'm actually part of the D word. I'm a developer, but a construction guy. So, but I, tonight's a very powerful night. I came here to just kind of hear, but I think it's important that people know that even as a developer, the last thing we want is to have a situation where it's, it's not cohesive. We do stuff in Belknap, we've worked with the neighborhood, we've worked with Suzanne and Kristen, and I think like of all the points tonight, there's just so much put into one, and I think there's some really viable points, and I'll give you an example. Like Don over there, we're friends, he's a great guy, he, we differ a little bit on things, but at the same point, like the zero setback line. We're working with a, a couple right now to build a new house in the city. They want a, a, a home in the city. Just to have that zero setback line makes that single family home a really nice unit for them. And that that's, I would bet 99% of the people in here would like to see that house go in the city. So those types of things make a lot of sense. I think the by right is a pretty strong approach. And even as a developer, we like to work with the community and make sure we're doing it the right way. So I think if we can fissure this out a little bit more, we really are on to something. There's a lot more in agreement and not all developers want things that the people don't want. So I think it's important to hear that. And yeah, I'm actually a little nervous tonight too. So anyway, <laughs> thank you. Dean, thank you. Thank you for coming to speak. I appreciate it. All right, any final comments before I close this public hearing? Mr. Miller, are you coming up? No, I just want to you, beg your indulgence for a hallway stand. Are you heading out the door or going to the restroom? <laughs> All right. 
So I'm going to go ahead and close this public hearing. And uh, commissioners, so this this public hearing is closed. And uh, I want to talk a little bit because initially uh, on the agenda, you probably saw this, um, that it just said closed. And so I want to talk tonight about uh, when it will be referred back for additional uh, dialogue and discussion around this table. Um, I think many of us have heard from a lot of people in the community about wanting to take more time and not to have it come back before us uh, right away. Uh, and so I just, there's, we have an opportunity to bring it back to Committee of the Whole at our next meeting, or we can say we're going to give it 90 more days, spend more time, uh, work with the planning department to do some more community engagement and have some conversations to see if there is some common ground. Uh, so I want to open that up right now so that those who are here tonight have a sense of next steps. I think that's fair. All of you came out. All of you have been actively engaged in this conversation, which we really appreciate. Um, the person who said that they feel like uh, they were ignored, uh, that, that pains us. We don't want anyone in this community to feel like they're being ignored. Uh, we are all in this together, and I think what brings us together is that every single one of us, we want Grand Rapids to be a place for anyone, regardless of their income, if they want to live here and raise their families here, we want them to be able to find a home. Uh, and that is what brings us together. And this is a complex issue. No city has gotten it right. Uh, cities all over this country are wrestling with this issue. Uh, and those that get it right are ones that work together and bring people together and find some common ground. So I want to personally thank all of you for coming out tonight, for being engaged. Uh, I think what Frank said is absolutely right. It's a beautiful thing to see so many people here tonight. Uh, so commissioners, I just want to, oh, this is, this is not typical. Uh, this isn't the usual process we go through after we have a public hearing, uh, but I do want to talk about next steps. Uh, and I'll turn to Commissioner Lanier first. Mayor, I think um, we've had 45 people to speak on this public hearing. And I think it would be great if at our next meeting we could talk about what those options are when we're a little bit more alert and not <laughs> on a down from all the candy we're eating. <laughs> we are eating, eating chocolate up here, by the way. And, um, you know, so maybe, maybe at that meeting we can kind of talk about what those next steps will be and if holding it open and, and having a process for more public comment or whatever, whatever we decide, I think it would be better if we decided that in a structure where we have more time to kind of digest these comments and then talk through them. Um, let me hear from others, and then I'll, I'll share my thoughts as well. Uh, others have thoughts on that? Commissioner? Yeah, I, I think I would generally agree with uh, Commissioner Lanier in the sense that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very open to the idea of just continuing a dialogue. Um, I think, you know, we've, we've heard from people. We've, we've uh, in, in a weird way, I think some of the dialogue has already started with conversations mm -hmm. that have been had between our nonprofit development partners and our neighborhood associations and meetings that we've, we've all had. Um, and so just ensuring that we figure out what the next steps look like so we can find a way to get to success yeah. that, mm -hmm. that, that has broad-based support. And so yeah, I don't necessarily think we're going to figure that out tonight, but I think we want to be mindful of yeah. that and have an intentional and thoughtful discussion about that at, a, at, a, at, our, at our next meeting. So, yeah, And maybe I should clarify, I, I am fine with holding off on, on the exactly what we're going to do for next steps. Uh, Typically, it would be at our next meeting to vote on, right. and uh, I, I personally am not prepared to vote yeah. on this no. next no. month uh, at our next meeting, and um, I do think we need to take more time, uh, and so I'm fine with us at our next meeting talking about next steps and process, and uh, but I, I also don't want people leaving this room tonight thinking that we're going to vote on this at our next committee of the whole meeting. So that's, that's the distinction I want to make. Clearly, we have a lot of conversation that needs to be had around this table about next steps. Uh, but typically, it would come back to us for a formal vote. And so as our interim city manager works on the agenda for our next meeting, I personally don't want it to come back to us on that's how sure as, a, as an actionable item where we will be voting. Um, and so I just want to see if you all agree with that. We can have it as a discussion item. Uh, are, are you? 
comfortable with that? Let me hear from other commissioners first. Commissioner Kelly? Yeah, and well, Mayor, I believe you're going to be gone on the 10th, so I don't know if you want to wait till you're back as well. Oh, yeah. But I agree that um, we're all tired after a long day, and our community, I think, is tired too because, you know, they've got, they've got a huge document to read if you haven't already done it, <laughs> for one thing. And we have a clerk, a city manager, and a budget to grapple with very soon here. So I think that uh, absolutely we need to slow this down and give everybody a chance to digest this. I'm hearing primarily that people want voice, and I'm a real supporter of that. Always have been. I, it, as has been pointed out, we've been talking all about community engagement all along and actually trying to, and investing in it. So, so I think we have to take that very seriously. And uh, the neighborhoods, uh, have also had a conversation and like I mentioned earlier, Commissioner O'Connor and I were the first invited to do that. They're going to have us come in um, a couple at a time. And one of the things that we discussed was that they get together, they've already had one meeting with the nonprofit developers, that they continue that um, dialogue, which I think that they will do regardless, uh, as long as we don't move forward and vote in, on anything. So I think that that, that will continue to happen and help inform us. So I'd like to wait until you get back, have that conversation, and um, focus on some of those other things, and then wait to hear. We will hear, I'm sure, because they meet every month yeah. about those conversations, and also give the community some time to digest this. I think that there are lots of, um, there's merit in some of these uh, proposals, but again, it comes back to um, community voice around the design and the placement and the appropriateness of, of where they go and what they're going to look like. Yeah, yeah good point. And I, I forgot, both Eric and I will be uh, out of town at a work-related meeting. So, uh, Could I, um, Madam Mayor, <coughs> excuse me, um, my voice is gone too. Uh, so when we, when we set up this hearing, we also, the resolution that established the hearings requires us to bring it back on the 10th and so what would be it okay. does so what would be good is if we um but but if you're interested in a discussion item on the 24th let's say that would be our next meeting after the 10th so i could schedule community a time on community of the whole for a discussion item to and where you could discuss process maybe at that time and then we could um we could go from there so would it be good to um i think I, got, I know I have a sense of your direction, uh, but we also have an official document here that says I, I need to bring it back. So I'd like to, I think it'd be good if you made a motion to schedule this, not to come back on the 10th, but have it come back on the 24th for discussion. So Eric, if I'm understanding you, you're saying when it comes back on the 10th, just postpone it. It's another way to do or, it, but then we have to put it on the agenda and sure. everybody is wondering what's going on. and. So if we could just be clear that we're not bringing it back on the 10th, uh -huh. then, then we don't have to deal, nobody has to be here on the 10th to make sure that's what happens. So that requires so. a vote? <coughs> I think so. Yeah. Oh, looks like Suzanne has a difference of opinion, or maybe clarity. Well, I, I, just, I just wanted to make you aware of that. I will. I um, <laughs> the National American Planning Association Conference uh, runs until the 24th. so. I won't be back until later on Tuesday the 24th, just so you know that. Kristen, of course, could handle it wonderfully, but I just wanted to make you aware, and just in case. Um, but we will be picking up a national award uh, while I'm there, okay. so. Which is great. Um, well, and you know what, then, you know, I, I have a, a you know, I, I have, I have a lot of faith in, in this body and, and Commissioner Lanier, who is president of the commission. Uh, the conversation can happen on the 10th and the the vote can be to table it then mm -hmm. i mean is it a, is it postpone. appropriate really or to postpone it mm -hmm. uh, i'm not sure it's a, appropriate for us to do it tonight and i do think that uh, sooner than later we need to think through uh, a, a process going forward uh, and and move forward and i, I don't want to hold that up i mean i yeah. i really i can meet with commissioner lanier before the meeting on the 10th and and yeah. share my thoughts uh, since I won't be there and, and trust the body to. Yeah, and maybe it could be written in such a way, Eric, that it removes the confusion. So if we'll you're concerned, I, I respect your concern that it'll be published and then people will believe 
that we'll be discussing it for a final vote if they're not here hearing this dialogue now. So perhaps maybe the memo could be written in such a way that that yep. discloses the intent. Yeah. We can do that because we had a, a really good discussion tonight about that. And right. we'll just include that in the memo. So exactly. I'm, I'm fine with that. And, and maybe you. including in the memo that um, that the date for it to come back to the commit, committee of the whole was included in our prior resolution when we set this hearing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Explain why. Actually, and it was to come back to the night meeting. So we're going to put this on the evening meeting on the, the, evening on the, on the, the 10th. 10th. And so you can talk about it there. And so we can talk about it then, come up with a, with a plan, and decide and how much time. Why not a committee of the whole? Uh, it was, it's an ordinance. Generally, we come back ordinance. to the evening meeting. Uh, I see. Okay. Unless it's directed otherwise. So we could always refer it there. OK. Either way. Mm -hmm. We'll get more time at Committee of the Whole. That's what, I mean, at least my experience. Yeah, that's is. why I was, yeah, I agree, but. Or, mm. <clears throat> All right, thinking Robert's rules in my head and what our options are. Can we, can we have the discussion on the 10th in the morning and vote right now to postpone the ordinance? And the last thing I want is on our agenda for the evening me right. meeting and ordinance, right. which yeah. implies that we're going to vote on it. Uh, and I think that's very, very confusing. Uh, so, so maybe we keep it on the, on the Committee of the Whole agenda for uh, a discussion to come up with a plan on how to move forward. Uh, and that will give us time to connect with Suzanne and talk about community engagement, a community engagement process. And then at the... Because we can postpone without a date to have it come back, yep. right? Yep. We don't have to. We don't have to identify a date tonight for it to come back. Correct. <laughs> okay, that's what I thought. Okay, so commissioner, maybe we should do that. We put a, a discussion item on committee of the whole, and then um, tonight we can we can make a motion to postpone, and then after the discussion on the tenth, we can have a conversation. But it won't it won't put us in a position where we have to cast a vote until we've had that discussion. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you have to suspend the rules in order to get the vote on the floor tonight? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yep. Commissioner Kelly? Yeah, I just want to say, though, that I, I'm hoping that we, before we wrap up our discussion anyway, that we have an opportunity to hear back about the conversation that is intended between the neighborhoods and the nonprofit developers. They had a very good meeting. I understand and at least clarified a lot of things. It was very civil. <laughs> and now they're eager to go back and do that again. So I don't want to rush that process. People have already been feeling so rushed. Well, and I, I think we need more time than, than two weeks to do that, mm -hmm. um, especially with spring break in the middle. Uh, and so that I think, I think we've heard a significant amount of feedback, mm -hmm. uh, both tonight but also in writing and phone calls and meetings that all of us have had, mm -hmm. um, that that is informative enough for us to have a discussion on the 10th, uh, which I think this warrants. And then we can, <coughs> bless you, sure. we can decide if we want additional community conversations to happen before anything comes back. Uh, whether we split out the four, whether there are elements of some of them uh, that we want to move forward and others we want to push to a master plan. Mm -hmm. All of those conversations, I think, we need a little more time to have mm -hmm. um, so that we, as so many people tonight, uh, reminded us that it really needs to be thoughtful. Mm -hmm. um, Sounds good. Does that, does that sound like a good plan? All right, so can I ask for someone to make a motion to suspend the rules? So moved. moved. All right, all those in favor of suspending the rules, say aye. 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 Those opposed? It carries. All right, and can someone make a motion to postpone bringing back these ordinance recommendations? Okay, and and our city attorney is saying, specifically say postpone indefinitely, indefinitely with not a, a date identified. Okay, yep, so moved. Yeah. Support. Support. All right, any additional comments about that? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, it carries. All right, thank you, thank you all. And thank you everyone who came out tonight, appreciate it. Uh, oh yes, and please, if you wrote on the comment cards, uh, please just drop them off in the back. Uh, our staff will compile those for us and all of that information will also be given to the full city commission. Okay, all right, and now we are going to move to our
We have another public hearing, so now I'm going to move to our fourth public hearing tonight. And this is a public hearing for an application to the <laughs> Michigan Department of Natural Resources Recreation Passport Grant for a grant at, make sure everyone can hear me, for a grant uh, at Riverside Park. Uh, and so I am going to start this public hearing by turning to our Parks Director to give us a little background information on this. Uh, and then after you're done, David, thank you for sticking with us, uh, then I will open it up for public comment. So David, do you want to start? Thank you. I think we need a slide that says parks now, not housing now. I should uh, <laughs> talk to the friends in the cable room. Um, parks are really the fabric that pull us together, right, as a community. Right. Uh, this is a grant application to the Michigan Department of Natural Resources uh, for $150,000 to support a $230,000 project. It's for an uh, uh, ADA accessibility uh, kayak launch in the park restroom upgrades for ADA hand handicap accessibility, uh, new park shelter, and uh, accessible paths within the park. This is a great project, something we heard coming out of the master plan, so we're pleased to be here for this public hearing. Yeah, thank you. Yep. All right, commissioners, any questions about this application to MDNR? All right, thank you, David. So if you are here tonight to speak on this grant application, which is a grant application to the Michigan Department of Natural, um, or MDNR, Recreation Passport, I know they're two separate, uh, and this is for Riverside Park. If you're here to speak on this application, then now is an opportunity to come forward. Uh, same rules apply. We ask that you share your name, the city you live in, and you'll be given up to three minutes to speak. If you've already come up to speak once before and your name's already on the list, you don't have to rewrite it. If you haven't spoken yet tonight, we'll ask you to add your name to the list. Um, so if you are here to speak on this request, now's the time. John, you coming up? Okay. It's only two, five after 10, why not use another three minutes and then another three minutes in open comments. Uh, I'm a resident, I'm John Rothwell, I'm a resident of Riverside Park. I support this 100%. Um, I use the park uh, almost on a daily basis. A couple things that I would like to see added to this, if they could, is I'd like to see dead trees pulled out of the river and the inland ponds within that park. It's kind of an eyesore. Uh, just to clean it up a little bit. The other thing I would like you to look at is look at the Fort Wayne model, uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana model of what they've done with the Heartland Park and a couple other parks. Um, in the summer, the lagoon gets to be, I call, uh, mossy, algae, all green covered. I'd really love to see a couple fountains put in there to see moving water to keep just the water turning to make it more of a better place and I fish and family and dog in the park every day so thank you I support it <laughs> you're welcome thank you John all right others who wish to be heard on this grant application for Riverside Park all right seeing none I'm gonna cl I'm gonna close that public hearing but I'm not gonna refer it to cow because we are now gonna vote on it uh, so it will fall under City Commission resolutions. so I'm gonna close that public hearing and uh, we'll move to City Commission resolutions and we have one item tonight and this is a resolution approving a submission of the MDNR recreation uh, passport grant application for the renovation of Riverside Park so moved. support Four. all right so commissioners any uh, final thoughts on that comments David anything to add it's due April 1st. We're going. Yay. All right. <laughs> all right. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? It carries. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much. you for your work on this grant application. All right. And next, that will take us to our last opportunity for public comment tonight. Um, so, this is an opportunity for you to come up and speak about anything that is on your heart and mind. Uh, same rules apply. We give you uh, three minutes uh, to speak. We ask that you share your name and the city that you live in and that you write down your name on that lovely list. Hi, welcome. Good, good evening. Hi. My name is Flavia Garcia. But, but, este, I'm, I'm living in Grand Rapids and the na neighbor is uh, Grand. Oh my God. <clears throat> I just said no, no. I will interpret and, for her. Okay, thank okay. you. We were in Grand Rapids and este, my colleague was 49507. Este, necesitamos una petición. Lo que pasa que este soy madre de familia de la escuela Burton y este la ciudad ha decidido retirarle el, la luz de este 
del, la, la luz para que la luz del semáforo para que pasen los niños al cruce de los niños y entonces es muy inconveniente porque a la hora de salida de los niños y a la hora de entrada es mucho demasiado tráfico y han estado paradas por dos meses entonces me tomé la libertad de colectar firmas de los padres de familia para que para ver si pueden dejar la luz o dar otra otra solución porque definitivamente los niños nadie para para que los niños crucen y nada más hay una sola persona que va a cruzar los niños ahí entonces los niños tienen que correr y se pueden caer ahí los pueden 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 haber muchos accidentes y ahorita de que ha estado parado de que ha estado parada la luz está intermitente entonces ha habido mucho problema porque ha habido tres a cuatro accidentes ahí y lo más problemático es la seguridad de los niños para nosotros como padres. Y quisiéramos ver si, si nos pueden ayudar, este, ver, darle, para darle una buena solución al problema, pues. Hi, my name is Joanna Rodriguez. I live in the third ward and I represent and work for the first ward. Um, and so the concern here is a traffic light on Buchanan and Kirtland. It has been um, flashing for the last three months. Uh, tres o cuatro meses? Two months. And when we went to see, it, apparently it's being uh, looked at being, it's, it's on the list for being taken down and no more light. So the concern that we have is that it is a danger to the children crossing. There's only one crossing guard and it's further up closer to um, Andre Street and so the children have to run um, in order to try to get to the traffic to the crossing guard. Um, it's a very important uh, light for us to cross. Um, it is, she mentioned that there have been three to four um, accidents um, we need that light to be working not just flashing but to be red and so forth um, she's uh, it does take a, a while for to cross over and it's also um, for teachers too because we have a parking lot across and um, I've had to cross it and it does take a while and I can't imagine what it's like for parents um, having to cross their kids over um, she's asking for a solution she's asking for help um, to keep this uh, light there um, hello and then we did collect forms, um, signatures from a community members saying that this is very important for them to, to have. And we're seeking your help in First Ward, please. Thank you. Yeah, and then on the housing, uh, I just want to say that um, I do have the pleasure of representing the families in that area. Housing is a big problem. 30% uh, of, of their income would be more doable for affordable housing. It is um, quite sad to see that, um, how much money that our families have to pay in order to stay in a decent home. Um, and I would like to see money um, funded towards fixing the lead um, paint issues. Uh, as a priority, um, so if you could work on the funding instead of maybe some of these other, um, someone mentioned like a, a housing funding, our families would really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. We just talked about that today. Um, I am going to ask Tom, I see you in the back, can you get some more information and then follow up with uh, Josh Nair more about that street light, that traffic light? Can, and can you report back to uh, the commission? Thank you. Mr. Gordy, once again, 568 Morris. I just want to follow up on what uh, they said right there. I uh, pick up a young lady and take her to work, and it's the house, the first house uh, to the south of Burton Elementary. So I pull in there, and that light is irrelevant in a way because it's, everybody goes through, it's just flashes yellow. The other thing is, when I wait, for the young lady to come out often. The, the, the light right there, the, tra the, the street lighting, it goes off and it takes quite a while, comes on for a couple seconds, goes off. So the lighting there is a double problem. So I've got to be so careful when I pick up that young lady not to wipe out somebody on that sidewalk as a pullman and not to hit somebody going across. So I think there's got to be some way to maybe to um, have a flashing thing like push the button, I don't know, something that 
lets drivers know also. Thank you much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gordy. Good evening. My name is Bob Cooper. I'm from the city. I'll put my name down in a minute. I wanted to talk to you about this past Saturday. Uh, last Saturday, March 24, there was a wonderful turnout at Rosa Parks Circle of hundreds of students protesting for change in gun laws to keep all of our schools safe from gun violence. I hope that some of you were there. I was struck by the energy and tenacity of the students and their clear willingness to pursue this issue until action was taken by all of our local, state and national governments to keep guns out of schools. I thought back a number of years to when I was in school, and probably you can think back too, to a time there weren't any guns around at all. Yet the Second Amendment was just as valid then as it is now. What is, what? Go back to schools with no guns, either inside or outside. The answer is to adopt laws that forbid guns in schools, laws that forbid guns in all public places. And it must start with this city commission. Please do not be intimidated by either other communities, other agencies, or by the NRA. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Rob Metzger again, 312 Prospect Northeast. Uh, I just wanted to revisit the, com uh, the commission and formally ask that you revisit an arbitrary decision that was made regarding the adding of a traffic light at Michigan and Prospect simply for the reason and convenience of a bus to do a U-turn on Michigan Avenue. Uh, not these commissioners, but this body made two arbitrary and capricious decisions regarding zoning at that intersection prior, which has completely made that intersection dysfunctional. So I simply would ask that it be revisited. Uh, I don't appreciate having the senior counsel for Grand Valley State University essentially threatening me when all I'm trying to do is protect my property rights and he's never even seen the intersection. So I appreciate your help. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, John Rothel again. To the officer in the back corner, please tell your colleagues and coworkers they did a wonderful job Saturday at the uh, at the March for Our Lives, they did a really wonderful job there, so you, the whole de department needs to be applauded for that. Now let's get to the other part of the March for Our, our Lives. Totally 100% agree with it. I would like to thank the city and their parking Nazis or whoever the uh, meter maids are that walk around giving tickets on Monroe when the street is closed. Thousands of marchers a half mile long are marching down the street. You can't get out of the spot. You're parked and you get a parking ticket along with everybody on the street. Way to go, city of Grand Rapids. Uh, I couldn't have got out of that parking spot if I tried. So uh, just want to say thank you for unleashing the uh, parking people for a city event that uh, was told to me by police and former hippies that this was the biggest event they'd ever protest they have seen since the Vietnam era in Grand Rapids. And I'm sure it paid for the police uh, overtime down there. So thank you. Thanks, John. Good feedback. Hello, my name is Miss Mary. Um, I'm here for the youth um, advocacy. Um, I'm going to first pass you our information. I'm going to want it back, so I'm going to fix up. Ms. Commissioner Zinita, your information is in here from the safe night. I'm going to start from here so they can pass it on down, okay? Thank you. Okay, what I, what I just gave them is uh, Ms. Commissioner Sanita, she have a safe night. Uh, it's called um, Safe Alliance for Everyone. So her initiative is in there. My question to her is, are you going to have a new initiative? Because I want to apply for that. Because I want to have like a multicultural uh, for, the, for Grand Rapids between like June, June and August. So I want to meet with you about a, a multicultural, uh, you know, for the city of Grand Rapids. 
And also I have the, the Neighborhood Match Fund, which I applied for, I think, in December. And something happened with the computer I was telling you about. And so I want to meet with you to get, can we have like a written paper or application besides the uh, computer, if possible? And so I'll talk with you about that also. And um, also, you see the Earth Day, and I think Earth Day is the 22nd of April, so we can do some Earth Day stuff. I mean, I grew up with Earth Day, so maybe, uh, you know, just, you know, in my system. But we can have the kids get an Earth Day for April, you know, get them out there planting flowers or what, you know, that initiative is. Um, I'm going to end with the parkland and also the marches that went on. I'm glad the, the, men, the gentleman before me mentioned that. They had, it wasn't even mentioned tonight, so I'm just glad you all really mentioned it. But I'm going to end with just a poem called Generation in Generation. I'm going to dedicate it to the youth and to parkland. It's called Generation to Generation. We wanted to be there, and that's a fact. We never did perceive the destruction of crack. We want you to succeed and grow up to be strong so you can grab the torch and keep marching on. And we cry when we see you kill one another and then wake up to find out that same guy is your brother. There is no need to fuss or to fight. You may only be two ships passing in the night. Life is too short, death is too short. It's our turn now. Together we can find a cure. You say, Miss Mary, what do you know? Where were you? Have you all forgot we're in the struggle too? Why is it so hard for us to love one another? What is it going to take to see that we are all sisters and brothers? There is no time now to fight and deceive. Wake up, wake up. We have not approached the 21st century. What will we tell our children? Brothers couldn't work it out. We just didn't try. We all had our doubts. Our folks and our people before us gave all, including their lives. Now how shall we repay them? We we'll love it with strife. Generation to generation, it is all of our decision. Shall we continue this destruction or will we finish the mission? We the people and read the preamble and the constitution for a lot of people that don't know it. So we got to upgrade on that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Mayor, if I could just um, ask Asante to connect with Miss Mary too regarding the upcoming pitch nights, the, some of the discussions that we've had. Asante, will you? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Oh, oh, thank you. You're thank welcome. you. All right, anyone else who would like to be heard tonight? Oh, this way. You can go whatever way oh, you'd yeah, like. You yeah? It's coming it's, around. It's coming around. They're still looking at it. Hello, Russell Olmstead, West Side, Grand Rapids. Um, just because I'm OCD or anal retentive or possibly both, the uh, sign-up sheet would probably be really good to have at the back of the line so that it's not, you know, distracting people while they're trying to be talking and distracting other people from being able to listen to them. So that's all. Thank you. That's good. Ad that's good advice. It's new, so we uh, we realized that tonight that it, it created a little bit of a bottleneck. So we'll adjust that uh, going forward. All right. Any final thoughts that you want to share with us tonight before I turn to my colleagues? Mr. Miller, are you really coming up this time? Real deal. All right. Real I know deal. you're the real deal. I was asking if you're coming up. Well, I'll, I'll talk Miller back. Uh, regarding Mr. Cooper's concerns, uh, this is, uh, why is this only happening in government schools? Okay, apparently. I haven't caught one in a Christian Orthodox Catholic school. Or these incidents at, what was it, Parkland down in Florida? Uh, one take is when a smart mouth, secular, secularist, supremacist, kicked the big fella out of, uh, out of the government schools, they also kicked out the fear of God. We had a national religion uh, 65, 70 years ago, and that was the fear of God. And... Uh, uh, this, these developments are not happening. Same constitution, uh, same availability of guns around. Of course, they're more dangerous. Uh, I thought that uh, you listen to CNN news and they were kind of winning the debate and a little bit better, more articulate than, uh, Fo say, Fox News, but we got that huge word in back of the Second Amendment. Infringed, okay? Uh, infringed. So, uh, uh, liberals will probably go on and uh, keep on winning the debate, making that the number one issue. Uh, they'll go through uh, West Virginia again, next cycle, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, and lose the pistol pack packing mama vote, just as Hillary did last time. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Miller. You have a good night. 
All right, anyone else who would like to be heard? Okay, seeing none, I'm gonna go ahead and close that public hearing and I will turn to my colleagues and I think I'll start down here with uh, Commissioner Rapart. All right, well, most of the people that I wanted to thank are gone, but for those of you who <laughs> stayed, uh, we, I admire your tenacity and I just think that we now have a new season of work. So I, we had to start somewhere and so I'm thankful. I know that they got, took a lot of hits tonight, but I'm thankful for the commission that that brought forth these proposals, thankful for the Planning Commission who had the discussion, and I'm also thankful for everybody that's come out and spoke. So we have a new season of work, a season of discernment, discussion, and adjustment, and uh, I feel tonight that we can get there. Well said. Great, well said yes, and thank you for coming, and um, I agree that this discussion has, this uh, controversy has elevated uh, this discussion and that in conflict there is opportunity. So we'll move forward with community input and I encourage all of you to do that homework that Suzanne and company mm -hmm. laid out for us. There's a lot of it, but it's really interesting material. I think if you take it a few pages a day, you'll get through it and, and we're gonna give you the time to do that. I also want to um, congratulate two influential women around this table at the Grand Rapids Business Journal Recognize one's not even listening to me over there, Sunita Lanier. <laughs> Still not listening to me. I'm sorry. Congratulations. <laughs> I'm listening now. I'm sorry. Thank Just you, Commissioner. I don't know what to do. I'm sitting in one spot forever. So, congratulations on your being influential women oh, in this. Oh, yeah. thank you. Absolutely. Uh, Commissioner Jones. Uh, I too want to say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you uh, to all the folks who came out this evening. It was uh, actually a good thing. I think that we had a room full of folks who had an opportunity to share their voice. I don't uh, expect that that will be the last large crowd that we'll have uh, because I think there are a lot of very heady issues that are before us that's going to require an all hands on deck approach. Uh, I just continue to ask and hope that people uh, in, in everything that we've discussed that we are using multiple lenses and that we are also most importantly using an equity lens because if we're that coupled with the historic lens and really consider uh, how we got to this place that we're at now and understanding that is uh, complex uh, but again if it, it sounds to me that there are more than a few folks who are willing to put the work in uh, because uh, ultimately, again, that's what this is. It's a whole lot of work because we're talking about something, some things that have uh, actually begun to transpire centuries ago. So this is not something we're gonna solve in a matter of uh, even a decade. Uh, we've got to, again, be committed to the work. So this is a, this is a good night, so thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Commissioner? But Sunita and I were just continuing an inspired housing conversation. Um, <laughs> uh, no, but it, 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 I really do appreciate everyone coming out and continuing the conversation, and that's really what this is about, is continuing the conversation that has been happening in, you know, in some form or another, at least for the last three or four years, around, around housing in Grand Rapids. And um, we're not the only community that's struggling with nature, the, the topic of affordable housing. And it's complex, it's layered, it's there's lots of nuance to everything you do. There's so much to learn. And I think it's just, you know, again, there's there's so many lenses you have to look through this. And there's so many, you know, we're, we're limited in our capacity in terms of the tools we have in our toolbox to be able to address some of these issues. And so as we look at housing, I, you know, I, I keep bringing this point up, and I just I really want it to be, like, something that you, you people really think about, is that we have to start with a base framework of what housing policy looks like in general, and you have to layer on affordable housing. And so some of these recommendations don't specifically speak to affordable housing, but given the way that zoning enabling legislation works, we're not able to specifically call out certain things based on the way zoning works. And so while we might like to do that, we might like to say, hey, we, all, we can only do this for affordable housing, it just it doesn't work that way. And so we have to be willing and able to try some things that create <coughs> options and yes, some for-profit developers may take advantage of it, but it's the things that our friends in the nonprofit housing community space have been asking us for and have been saying these are real opportunities for us to do, to continue the good and the great work that we're already doing in forms and types and places that we currently can't do it. And so we just please keep an open mind and 
keep the dialogue going so we can, you know, we need to get yes because not doing anything uh, is going to result in, you know, a furthering, uh, worsening of the situation we're in. So. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Lanier? Yeah, I'll be brief. Um, thanks to those who um, shared <coughs> comments this evening and, yeah, good night. Yeah, thank you. Um, and with that, I will add my thanks to all of you and I hope you have a wonderful night. Drive safe.